This is three hours of the very best Reddit revenge stories of the year. How I got my landlord arrested for auto theft. I used to live in a rental townhome. The place was great. It was run by a big company, but they paid an on-site super to run the office, coordinate repairs, etc. When I moved in, it was this nice older retired couple. A few years later, they moved on and the company hired these two young dudes. They were buttholes. Recent college grads who looked down on the blue collar tenants, did loud parties all night, generally ignored the grounds, ignored maintenance requests, etc. But that's not how I got them arrested. In addition to renting the townhouse, you could rent a covered spot. If you did, they gave you a hang tag. And if you didn't have the hang tag, you'd get towed. I had the same car, same spot and same tag the whole time I lived there. One day I come out and my car is gone. It was towed for no hang tag, but in the pictures the tow company took, it's clearly there. I paid to get it out and complained to the two idiots. They had to call to authorize a tow. The company couldn't just do it on their own. They gave me a terrible apology. About a week later, same problem. Again, towed for no tag. Again, the tag's right there. This time I called the corporate office and complained. After that, it started happening nearly every day. When I talked to the supers about it, they just laugh. I knew they were doing it on purpose, so I did some research. The tow company gave me the names of the people who called it in, and it was mostly one guy, but sometimes the other. The tow company wasn't liable because the landlords had called them, so that was out. But I did some research and found out that in my state, calling for a tow when you know it's not a legal tow is grand theft auto, just like if you broke into a car. I also found out you can record conversations in my state without telling the other person. So I went in to meet the two bros to talk about the situation They told me on tape that the first two times were mistakes But after that they did it on purpose and would keep doing so until I learned my lesson They stated that they knew I was okay to park there, but they didn't care I took that recording and the list of calls to a buddy who's an attorney and he helped me to take it to the local police The police were more than happy to have a couple felony charges dropped into their laps So they filed charges and went to arrest them corporate fired them the same day Refunded all of my fees for getting my car out of hock and gave me a rental discount for a few months They both ended up eating the felony and got probation last I heard they weren't able to find decent jobs because of the felonies and also couldn't pay their student loans Both ended up working construction, which they'd sneered at because that's all they had left And there we go. I guess not stealing in the normal sense that you'd imagine, but technically and legally, definitely stealing. Straightforward solution, an elegant revenge. Good stuff. Let's carry on. My boss thought she could insult everyone, so I made her pay for everyone's vacations. Last year, I took a summer job for a kids camp. It seemed to be quite well paid, and I wanted to know how working with kids would go. The hiring process was a little odd. As for the interview, I was called unexpectedly, and a woman, who later became my boss, spoke on the phone for about two and a half hours, asking some really weird personal questions. For example, she asked, You want a COVID idiot, are you? Remember that, it will be a factor in the story. Anyway, I needed the money, and it was the only callback I'd gotten so far. Far, so I took it. She then made us all come in two times before starting the job so that she could explain it to us. Both times it went on the whole freaking day without being included in our payments because it wasn't mandatory. I got to be the boss of my team. Then the first day came around and we faced 20 plus children with their parents. But the boxes with the nameless, the toys, and everything wasn't there. We basically improvised and wrote their names as they came in and hoped that they are indeed signed up. Later, the boxes arrived, but the contents were measly at best. She'd given us two kinds of games, Uno and something else, three times over. We got little instruments for the kids to decorate, but when she came around to check on us a few days later, she screamed at us. The freaking kids, she said shouldn't have been allowed to take the instruments home, which she'd never told us and made no sense. The next few days went on like this. She came around and screamed at us for doing something that made sense to every one of us, pretending she'd instructed us otherwise at the unpaid, non-mandatory orientation meeting, which I attended every time, but she just talked about her personal life. No instructions. She went on and offended every single person in existence. She doesn't want to have lactose intolerant or handicapped kids in the camp because they're too much of a hassle. My Muslim colleague got scolded for wanting to go home to her toddler after a 10 hour shift. And she asked in front of everyone if her son still sucks on your titties. 
because else she doesn't have any reason to go home parents with questions or complaints are to be educated like kids because they behave like that when they didn't get screwed by their wife the night before also she made us work more than 12 hours without a break and then she'd trash on me when i stood up and went home at the 12th hour we have a law that requires us to leave at that time but two events stood out when she went after the kids on the first occasion you have to remember that this woman has an unhealthy obsession with corona she not only changed the rules of everything anytime it fit her narrative with us she also did that with the parents which led to misunderstandings every single day so she asked the children age four to ten which one had done an antigen test and who had a pcr test Of course, the children didn't all know what that was, and a little five-year-old girl raised her hand for the false one. When the witch, my boss, noticed that, she gave this poor girl the scolding of her life and told her that she's as dumb as a rock for not knowing the difference. I'm pretty sure this girl had spit in her face. I was so in shock, I probably should have slapped her for it, but I didn't. The girl tried hard not to cry and didn't come back days after. The second incident was even more disturbing. A four-year-old boy hit his head at the playground when they were all outside. I was back in the office when my colleagues came running in. I called the boss while my colleague called the ambulance. When I told her what had happened and that my colleague was already on the phone with the ambulance, she scolded me. But not because that boy got hurt. No, no, because we'd called the ambulance. In her world, it wasn't that bad. And his father shouldn't find out, as if he was blind and wouldn't have seen the open wound anyway. The ambulance came, told us it was completely fine, but it was mandatory to call them in this case as an institution, and the boy suffered no further injury. He is fine now, thankfully. But I was furious. I was completely freaking out in anger. I'd only worked there for nine days, and the kids, as well as us, had been abused enough. Instead of going after my impulse to call her back and tell her off, I calmed myself. And the next day, I didn't go to work, but to the doctor. I explained to the doctor that my boss abuses me, but I can't terminate the contract early. So to keep me from snapping, she put me on a sick leave without end dates. My boss was not amused when I sent her that doctor's notice, but I ignored her calls. I then proceeded to talk with my teammates and encourage them to get sick leave and told them exactly what they could do and say to get that. My boss even tried to get rid of my Muslim co-worker illegally. I explained to her that the paperwork from them is not legal and she should ignore it and also go on sick leave. So in about a two week frame, my location had to replace all six people, including me, the boss of the team. And I took all records home too, so my boss couldn't just pass them on. I also changed the password to my email account and did everything to just annoy her. The story doesn't end here. As I found out, the word spread like a wildfire. And because she was such a POS to everyone at every location, one month after the start, she'd lost more than half of her staff. Some of them still had to be paid sick leave. Apparently, she called some of them and begged them to come back, offering bonuses as high as double the pay, but still, nobody came back to help. The silver lining was that the parents had also had enough, and many kids were taken out of that camp. So, come the end of July, I was on vacation, well, sick leave, and she calls. She proceeds to tell me, suspiciously calmly, that if I don't want to come back next month, I should hear her now, please. And she offered to end my contract without further obligations and give me my payment for the whole month of July. I tell her that I'm going to come back. I just really want to feel better, not be sick and other BS like that. And of course, I just didn't. And I proceeded to collect one additional full month of sick leave without even ever speaking to her directly again. I also went out of my way to continue offering information for every single staff member of all the locations that wanted to leave and still get paid or wanted to know where they could report the boss. So in the end, this is what my boss got for being a disrespectful cow. She lost half or more of her workers. Everyone hates her and wants nothing to do with her. Really bad publicity included. She had to pay me the full two months. My vacation time out in money which is quite expensive for them, as I didn't take it because I was sick, pay my overtime and the mandatory bonus you get for doing extra hours, all of that multiplied by six at least. That meant that I got around 6,000 euros for nine days of work from her. Her entire enterprise went downhill. And finally, of course, I also had to get my money through legal support. So that came onto her too. I can't explain how much detail I put into the legal planning in order to get all the people paid out as much as possible without any chance of legal repercussions ever. 
My butt is safer than safe. She will never be able to retaliate on what I did. I studied law for a while and got everything double checked by professionals. She tried to harass me. I blocked her. But I heard she read my personal information to the other colleagues who stayed there and called me all possible names. So if she ever tries to sue me or blackmail me, I have evidence and witnesses of her trying to dox me, insulting me and various other things. Honestly, after I've written all that down, I'm now kind of proud, but also surprised at how nicely it all worked out. I didn't see any listings searching for that project this year. So hopefully it went downhill, and I hope she went back to hell where she came from. Oh, well, just unemployment. Okay, look, the revenge here is fantastic and I love it. Fair play to you, OP, for doing this. I've got to say, though, the first thing that comes to my mind is how on earth does a woman like this end up in this profession where she clearly is not right for it, hates it, it's just a total cow, wants nothing to do with it, but finds herself doing this as a job? I don't get it. This woman should not be allowed anywhere near kids, clearly, yet this is her profession? I don't understand. I'm not even joking here. Surely at some point you have to get child protection authorities involved. There is no way she should be allowed within five meters of any child, even her own. I'm sorry, but it's true. Now, for those of you wondering how OP got away with being perfectly healthy and just getting a doctor to write all this off and going on permanent sick leave, they do kind of explain in the comments down below how it was possible. It turns out that all the employees had kind of ongoing health issues. Talks about his depression, um, some people having long COVID, another with anxiety, bowel problems, that sort of stuff so they did have underlying things things that wouldn't necessarily stop them from being able to go to work but when they needed them they could kind of use them and this nice doctor to get what they wanted if that makes a little bit of sense you didn't get it in writing no you here is a story about the first job that i had a decade ago disclaimer there's some vagueness ahead because both parties the company and myself displayed some awful behavior leading to some horrendous consequences for all all in the name of revenge. So I was a new but qualified recruit in a small team that was working with a very large client and stakeholder in the company. Despite my skills, it was my first real job fresh out of grad school. So I was inexperienced with office politics, contract law, power hierarchies, and more. The clients had given us an almost impossible task to prototype a complex solution to a technical problem that they had. As the only one in the team with the relevant expertise, the burden quickly fell on me to deliver alone while the others essentially managed. The team leader and effective boss promised me at the beginning that I would get a bonus worth roughly 30% of the salary on which I was hired. Apparently, this bonus was a direct financial contribution from the big clients themselves, and the wheels were in motion to get this extra cash. Great, but not really because it wasn't in writing. Over the next two years, however, no such bonus compensation transpired. I would periodically and half-heartedly ask about this bonus during in-person meetings, and I was verbally reassured it was on its way. In hindsight, I would have been more assertive and perhaps sent an email, but again, I was a newbie and unwilling to bite the hand that feeds, so to speak. After these two years, the company began to expand business with the client as a direct result of the work that I was on, the impossible project. At some point, the clients even present all that hard work of mine at some international conferences, of course, claiming it as their intellectual prop and proprietary solution. Although the project ownership rightfully and lawfully belonged to them, the lack of acknowledgement left a bitter taste in my mouth. And worse was that money was flowing around and both companies were profiting from two years of my painstaking efforts, but there was no bonus in sight. So my work contract was also nearing its end in the third year. Obviously, the company wanted to retain me to continue on this project. I was the only one who knew the ins and outs of it. It would be a joint employment between the company and clients, as I would be tasked with transitioning the project from the company to the clients, which would require several more years to do so. I also went through half a year of specialist training with the clients. Only I could do this job for the foreseeable future. For this, I was offered a decent increase in my salary, but that missing bonus was ruining my trust. At a contract negotiation meeting, I asked about it one last time. The team leader and boss said that they had no recollection of such an agreement or offer and that I should have got it in writing. Fair enough, some lessons are learned the hard way. But the worst realization was that the missing bonus, a measly 30% of the new hire salary for almost three years, was now earmarked for an intern to join me on the project. It was almost a one-to-one -one calculation as the client would sponsor the intern with the funds that were intended bonus for me. It was the last week of the work contract and human resources had invited me to double check the document before I was to sign it. 
Of course, given all the time, money, training and resources invested in me continuing on this project and my very real eagerness to do it, it was assumed that I would be here for the long haul and the work contract was a formality. So what happened next is something that I do not recommend that anyone try at home or work for that matter. It was a moment of impulse from a reckless youth. However, I was feeling particularly vengeful about this missing bonus. My ego had been bruised because I wrongly trusted them to follow through, but I wasn't clever enough to get the agreement in writing. Well, Uno reverse card moments, there was also no written agreements on my end. So I had not yet signed the contract. I carefully double checked my emails and there was nothing in writing where I agreed to continue on this project or even this job. In fact, I'd just been verbally enthusiastic about the project during meetings with my boss and the clients. The first new workday rolls around when I'm officially no longer employed at the company or with the clients. I gave no notice and no warnings. I just abandoned them. On the previous day, I had left my company pager and phone in the office locker. I had to sacrifice a few personal possessions on the office desk. I logged out of the work email messenger system so they couldn't reach me. I'm not sure how they responded because I ignored and deflected every single communication which came my way for the following months. It was bliss knowing that I probably caused this company a major catastrophe for the next few years at least. Of course, I couldn't predict the consequences that they would face from my abrupt and unannounced exits, but I did not have time to care about them. I had to become selfish and I had to dip into my savings and relocate and start afresh and anew in another city far away, which was very difficult without references, considering the professional bridge that I just burnt, hence the not recommending parts. But eventually, my skills began to speak for themselves. The last I heard about the company was from an ex-colleague as we reconnected on an online professional network a few years ago. Apparently, the company still exists, but it's a shell of its former self as things went horribly south after I left. They lost the big client as I had anticipated. No one else had the skill set to do work. The clients are still players in the sectors, but I have the great fortune of not having had to interact with them so far. But I could not have predicted the domino effect that followed in the company. A few more large clients followed soon after because staff had to be reshuffled to do my project and these other clients felt neglected. Now the company is downsizing and in the process of being swallowed by a competitor. From what I gather, the other big casualty of the revenge is my ex-boss developed some substance problem around this time to cope with this stress, triggered in part by not being able to contact me for months on end during a critical time in the company's expansion. Throw in a divorce too, because this work stress destroyed the marriage as well. I did feel a little bit guilty when my ex-colleague explained all this, and I still do. Is it enough for me to right my wrongs and write an apology or something? Not really, but perhaps I'm wrong here. I am open to suggestions. A quick note, this ex-boss has tried to get in touch with me a few more times, some years after things went downhill, but I was too busy, so I just continued to ghost him. But anyway, here is to that disgusting company. I hope it was worth the measly bonus that I deserved. I was brought on as a new recruit and I was a junior who had to lead the project from get-go. I had to work hard and learn new skills in the hours outside of work just so the fat clients and middle management could reap the rewards, not on my vengeful watch. The reason that I am writing this is that it's somewhat cathartic. The company did some terrible things and so did I. But this missing bonus still eats me from time to time. I could have bought a house and I could have settled down in that old town. I wouldn't have been displaced for months and living with my head just above the water, having to rebuild myself for a good few years following that. Abandoning the project and the job was professional suicide at the time. But my revenge was such that whatever happened, I would try to get through my life without groveling back to that company. Of course, this arrogant buttholery of mine, born from this hatred having not gotten that bonus, still has at least one unwritten chapter. At the current workplace, where I'm also a stakeholder now, I am now proposing a new version of that old project I began a decade ago and never got a chance to see to completion. It would be nice to showcase a patent during an international conference attended by those big former clients. That would be the real bonus. So yeah, mistakes all around with at best mixed endings for all parties. 
but at least it's finally good to get this in writing. Honestly, at this point, I feel like you guys know what I'm about to say. The amount of times that I read stories like this and a company that's in a great spot refuses to pay a worker just a little bit more than they're already on or doesn't give them that bonus like in this situation. Being unnecessarily stingy and just downright unfair. I mean, they've promised you a bonus and not given you one and it's led to the entirety of the company just collapsing. Like, give the bonus in the first place. Reward your excellent employees, the ones that are working so hard and bring you these massive clients like OP and this would never have happened. What is a small little increase in bonus compared to the decimation of your entire company? Answer me that, Mr. CEO. I mean, it is actually pretty terrible. They lied to you for three years effectively about your bonus and then use that money just to get an intern instead. What? Again, it's one of those stories where I feel like they just thought they could get away with it and could carry on as they already were taking advantage of you and clearly you were better than them. And, you know, fair play for you for sticking up for yourself, not signing the contract, which is what the majority of people would have done. And, uh, yeah, achieving good things as a result. My sister doesn't want to free her live-in unpaid maid. So I got her fired. Obligatory backstory. Many of you have probably heard of families with strong hierarchy structure, normally with the eldest in the family having the most influence. Now, my family is one of those, except that my parents are drug addict deadbeats. So my eldest sister, who is 31, who will be the entitled mother of this story and will be referenced as such, raised all five of us. She is the boss of the family. She says jump, everyone says how high. The focal point of the story is my youngest sister, who I'll call little sister. She's 20 years old. Most of us have a handful or at least a couple of memories with our mother before she lost her mind, except for little sister. For her, our oldest sister is the only mum she ever had. And our oldest sister knows how to take advantage of that. All of us noped out of our parents' house as soon as we turned 18 except for our older sister, who waited until little sister and our brother were raised and in their mid-teens to move across the country and soon found jobs and accommodations for all of us to move to the same state as her. Little sister begged for years to move in with her, but entitled mother, again, that is the 31-year-old older sister, always denied, saying that somebody had to take care of our father and because she and her new husband needed privacy and space. That was until entitled mother got pregnant. She got little sister to move in with her and she's been there for the past two and a half years helping out. Now to the story. Entitled father's family, I assume that is entitled mother's husband, wanted to visit for a couple of weeks. So little sister had to stay with me for that time so that they could use her room. It's worth noting that entitled mother didn't ask or let me know about it. She just dropped our little sister off. One day, she saw me studying for my master's degree and said something about how she always wanted to go to college. And this is how it went. So why don't you? I said. Oh, well, I talked to entitled mother about it, but she said not everyone is the college type and that I wouldn't have time to work, study and take care of niece at the same time. And it's expensive. Most people work and study at the same time and she can put niece in a daycare. I'm sure it wouldn't be that much more expensive than what she's already paying you, but she doesn't pay me. She already gives me food and shelter. And if I need money, I just take a shift at work. And this is how I learned that my sister was not only babysitting, but also cleaning the entire house for free every day. She was only able to work eight hours per week at her normal job because she was too busy taking care of our niece. Long story short, it took me weeks to convince her to apply to community college and then more weeks on the actual process. But she finally got confirmation that she would start in September. All of that was behind Entitled Mother's back. She was planning on telling everyone the next time we all got together, which would be Independence Day. But before that could happen, Entitled Mother got everyone together at her house to announce that she was pregnant. Little Sister starts crying at this point because now she wouldn't be allowed to go to college. Entitled Mother gets deeply hurt and offended that she planned this behind her back. I butt in. Our other siblings butt in. It's just generally a mess. How could you do this to me? Who's going to take care of the babies? I can't believe you'd be so selfish. If you like OP so much, go and stay with her. These were all some of the things that she said. She kicked me and little sister out, who stayed with me until they made the peace. Both of our siblings reached out, one to say that I should have minded my own business and the other to tell me she was on my side but wouldn't say anything. After that, little sister moved back with her 
and didn't go to college but they agreed she'd get paid six dollars an hour and would be allowed to take more shifts at her normal job until the baby is born and then go to real college after the child turns one year old look i know it's messed up but all of them especially little sister worship entitled mother like a god i waited a year to act on my revenge making sure my sister had saved enough money to live on her own. So here we go, the revenge. First, what I did was research the legality of paying a homeless person in food and shelter. In the US, and depending on the state, it's legal as long as you do not cross the line and the person becomes an employee. For example, you can give the person a list of tasks you want done. However, you cannot say that it has to be done in a certain amount of time. You also cannot request someone to be somewhere at a certain time. You can ask, but not demand on the time. It comes down to a choice of words. Also, you have to comply with rental laws. If your local law said that you must give 30 days notice to a tenant, then you must give 30 days notice to this person as well. Now, I had proof of all of the situations. Several screenshots of entitled mother admitting to not paying and not allowing little sister to move out or get a job and also admitting to kicking her out whenever she wanted. All this technicality seemed worthless since nobody would sue her, but that didn't matter. I just wanted to make sure that her boss knew that if she were to be sued, it would be a sure case. Now, Entitled Mother works for a civil rights attorney's office, so discovering she has a literal modern-day slave would probably get her fired. I could have just created a burner email and sent it all to her boss, but then they would explain to her why she's getting fired and that would get me and little sister in trouble. So what did I do? Well, Entitled Mother was always complaining about one of the bosses on her job that hated her and had tried to get her fired for ages. I went to the company sites, found the woman. Thankfully, she was the only Ashley that worked there, found her on Instagram and on Facebook. There, she had a post tagging her yoga studio. I went to said studio and created my membership. It took a few weeks of trial and error trying to find exactly what class Ashley belonged to, but I finally found her. Then I went to yoga class every Tuesday and Friday at 8 a.m. for months, slowly building a friendship with Ashley. Around three months in, she asked to follow me on Instagram and I was already prepared for this scenario, having deleted the few pictures I had with Entitled Mother. After nine months, when our friendship was a strong baby, I brought up the crazy coincidence that I found out she worked with Entitled Mother, my older sister. Before things could get awkward, I said, it's ironic that she works for civil rights, considering, you know, everything. That got Ashley's attention and I told her everything. I showed her every screenshot. I could practically see her eyes shining. They had their own history that's not important to the story. All you need to know is, Entitled Mother is a female dog, and Ashley actually wants revenge as much as I do. I told her about Little Sister's situation and why Entitled Mother couldn't ever know about this. This is why being friends with Ashley was so important. If I just sent her the proof and explained the situation, they probably would have just ignored it. Since this was a very legitimate reason to fire her and they wouldn't risk firing her for a minor mistake and maybe getting sued. I sent her the files with her promise that Entitled Mother wouldn't hear about this, but she needed them to convince the other owner, who was the reason why she wasn't fired yet. Two months later, Entitled Mother was fired for minor mistakes, lateness, and general bad productivity. A small victory, sure, but I loved coming to visit her during the four months she was unemployed. She looked so tired and miserable all the time since she had no money to pay for a babysitter and little sister is away at college, so she actually had to take care of her own children. Moral of the story, check on your siblings. They might be living in a modern slavery arrangement. I mean, honestly, that is genuinely mind-blowing to me. Forcing your youngest sister, who you know worships you because of, you know, how amazing you might have been earlier in life. And that is fair enough. Fair play to you for raising your other four siblings. That's pretty impressive stuff. But forget that. That's done now. Brainwashing her, forcing her to work for you for free. That's crazy. You know, ruining her hopes and dreams of going to college and living her own life. Forcing her to stay and work for you in your house. Unbelievable. How could you do that to another sibling of yours? All I can say is thank God OP found out and is involved in this family and did something about it. Unbelievable that sort of stuff happens in this modern day. The only thing that I'm a little bit 
confused by is that you did, OP, let the little sister go back to your older sister's house for a period of time. Now, maybe it's easier said than done, but surely you shouldn't have done that because you never know what might have happened there. She's already exploiting her to an unbelievable extent. Could she have gone one step further? Like, you never know. So that's the only thing I'm a little bit like, mm, not sure about that. The rest of it, yeah, he did amazingly. Great revenge as well. Very important, as you say, to keep it secret, the reason for her firing so that she didn't realize it was your work and that meant that your little sister could get out okay. Good stuff. Don't want me to work my notice? Okay, I won't work during my notice. I was working in an organization that was super toxic. So much so that we were a revolving door. Most employees stayed only for a few months. To counter this, our management put a three months notice into everyone's contract, including the existing employees. Now that's not strictly illegal where this happened, but it is very unusual. I believe the idea behind that was to make it harder for the employees to find a job outside as potential employers didn't usually want to wait for three months. However, this didn't work as most people simply quit and then waited for a month or two before starting their job hunts. I was there for almost four years. I needed the money, so I put up with whatever abusive stuff was thrown at me. My boss was a guy we'll call Vince, not his actual name. Now, Vince was not particularly good, but he sometimes respects the fact that I was the most tenured grunt in this organization. Do note that after about two years, I was doing a lot of additional work in addition to my official responsibilities, primarily because I was the only one who knew how to do those. Everyone else had already left. This is important for later. Enter Rajesh, also not actual name. Rajesh was poached from a somewhat infamous company and was literally flown in from a different continent. He was brought in to strategically improve our division. This was quite strange given that our division generated most profits. Within months, Rajesh made the environment even more toxic. He pulled Vince's team under him and got Vince fired and he actively encouraged us grunts to spy on each other. Rajesh also had it out for me from day one. Until today, I don't know why. He started making my life much harder than the others and this culminated in him taking me aside and telling me that I was not pulling my weight. Now at this point, I was doing quite well in the organization and I've been doing a lot of additional work critical to our business since only I knew certain systems and processes. See high attrition above. So I was quite angry and I started looking out for something new. Yeah, I wasn't brave enough to quit and start looking, but I was looking nonetheless. Fortunately, I was able to find a job that was willing to wait the three months. So it was my turn to take Rajesh aside and tell him I quit. Boy, Rajesh was fuming. He went from denial, you can't quit, to negotiation. What if I give you a raise at the year end? before acceptance. Thus, I was serving my notice and working away like an honest bee, my usual work and the additional work. At this point, I was called in by HR and told that Rajesh wanted me gone. The insane part was that they wanted me to pay the company for the two and a half months shortfall in notice. I obviously refused, then went back and checked the initial contract. It turns out that a notice of less than three months could only happen through mutual consent and the initiating party, the company if they wanted me gone sooner, or me if I wanted to leave earlier, had to compensate the other party for the shortfall. So the next day, I stopped doing almost all of my work. I logged in and logged out my hours and did nothing. I stopped doing any additional work that I've been doing and started taking it really, really slow on my primary job responsibilities. Since no one else understood the details of what I did, I knew it would be very hard for Rajesh or HR to prove that I was doing any of this on purpose. Then I sat back with my popcorn. Soon there was a complete meltdown all around. Rajesh would pull me into meetings and scream and try to bully me and I'd say nothing but smirk in his face. Next, they tried to have someone else learn the additional work I used to do from me so that they could do what I did. Remember I said earlier how I was the only one who knew some of the old systems and processes? Well, now I claimed I didn't really remember any of them. So obviously there could be no handover. Rajesh could do nothing as none of this had been my responsibility or part of my contract since the leadership had been only too happy to see me to do this for free. Soon my workplace turned into a dumpster fire. The HR and Rajesh smartened up and offered to buy out my notice if I cooperated and helped transition my work. I refused. Then, to twist the knife further, I started having meetings with fellow grunts. Remember, everyone was always a newbie and encouraging them to leave as well. Indirectly, that is. Nothing that could implicate me. HR tried to get me to leave twice more 
but I ended up serving the full three months. Remember, the mutual consent part. Honestly, it's like the company forgot that it was made up of people and employees. Because when the people go, the company's nothing. Why do I see so many stories like this? It bemuses me every time and I will never understand it. Oh wow, I've got one comment here that says, what happened when you left? Did Rajesh get fired? And OP has replied, no. He ran the division to the ground and got everyone laid off, then left for greener pastures. Last I heard, he was doing very well for himself. That just shows what kind of bloke he is. Embarrassing. Like sacking everyone else off, using everyone else to just, you know, do better for yourself. Sham was of a bloke. Disgusting. Good on you for not just looking after yourself, by the way, but also telling brand new employees that this is not a good place to work at. You need to be quitting because, you know, yeah, it's all well and good. You doing well out of this, but what about the future employees of this horrific company? They would have been screwed without your advice. So uh, yeah, selfless. I love it. Good stuff. Rajesh, you disgust me. You really do. Screw me on my bonus. Make me do two jobs. Enjoy the backwater you earned. So... Back in the 90s, I was working for a European-based financial firm. US offices were managed by Europeans with a regional head office in New York. Younger employees were generally underpaid and overworked, as in your first few years out of college, the promised reward was being promoted to a director position, where the salary, perks, and bonus structure would really kick in. Kind of like how law firms promote their younger lawyers to partners after a long wait. As junior associates, the only good news was that we received the same five weeks of vacation per year, plus a few weeks of sick leave, as our European counterparts, which for me meant a lot of camping and staycations during the summer, since I didn't really make enough to travel to exotic and expensive locations. The offices were set up in a way where the business development, BD, directors each had a junior associate. The BD guys would generally network, schmooze, and travel around their territories to meet clients and new prospects. Once back in the office, the BD guys would dump their meeting notes on the desk of their junior associates to follow up and land the business, aka a Hunter Skinner model. As a junior associate, I was pretty busy assisting a BD, so I routinely rolled over at least two weeks of vacation every year. I'd worked at the firm for three years and was starting to get antsy for a promotion. Right after Thanksgiving, my boss in the West Coast office told me that I was being transferred and promoted to the Southeast office come the new year. I really had no interest in working or living in the Southeast, but I wanted to advance my career. I rolled over my usual two weeks of vacation into the next year so that I was eligible for seven weeks of vacation that next year. After celebrating New Year's with my family in CA, I packed up my car and drove across the country. Once in the new office, I settled in and met my new boss, who promptly informed me that he wasn't actually promoting me to director, though I was being given the responsibilities of the role as he judged me to be too young, but was also told that if I demonstrated that I could do the job, I'd be promoted next year. I was fuming, but I didn't have a choice other than moving back home and starting from scratch, so I had to agree to it. I disliked my new boss instantly. As co-workers told me, he was flaunting his management perks, which consisted of large allowances for housing and automobiles, which were paid for by sales production from employees like myself. It turned out that he was related to a serving member of the board of directors back in Europe, which is how he got the job as a regional manager. Everyone knew he didn't have the skills to do our job, so he just collected fat checks, went to expensive restaurants with friends, and billed it to the company as client development, all the while leasing a new Mercedes every two years on the company's dime, while generally being an idiot to everyone who worked for him. During the first week, I also met my junior associate, Jeremy. We sat down and discussed some accounts that I'd inherited that were in backwater locations none of the other directors wanted to visit. Jeremy was professional, but I got the distinct impression Jeremy hated me, though I didn't know why. I started traveling around to meet my clients and prospects over the next few weeks, usually spending at least three or four days on the road, back in the office on Friday to go over follow-ups on business leads with Jeremy and then execute whatever paperwork needed to be taken care of. About a month later, I returned from one of my trips and learned that Jeremy had quit. It turned out that he was mad that he'd been passed over for the position that I'd been given. I couldn't fault him as I probably would have done the same thing. I asked my manager to hire someone else to back me up. 
but he was hesitant to do so reasoning that my client portfolio was just starting out so i could do both roles until it made sense to staff up i pointed out that it would be hard to be an effective business development officer if i had no support system to help grow my client portfolio but he chose not to listen knowing that i had little recourse but to shut the heck up i spent the rest of the year working my butt off this was right before email and internet were common so executing business on the road was hard fax machines were the bane of my existence even though laptops were reserved for directors my boss was kind enough heavy sarcasm to let me use a company laptop on which i would handle all of the paperwork to process client business from hotel business centers late at night or early in the morning so i learned to live on five hours of sleep or to sleep on planes whenever i could sounds like fun after dealing with problems from some irate clients i eventually paid for my own personal cell phone not everyone had them in the mid 90s and our directors had just started getting company paid phones that year as i had to handle customers from the road i just gave my personal cell number for clients to call so that i could handle problems as i went i landed a few big clients by a combination of luck and hard work and got some solid referrals which led to more referrals so within a few months i was gaining some serious momentum since i didn't have an associate to help me that meant i spent the weekends and late nights back at the office handling paperwork then back on the road during the week i was so busy working both sides of the job that by december of that year i hadn't taken my mandatory two weeks of vacation i had some new clients that needed to be handled by year end so i was granted a vacation waiver meaning that my seven weeks of vacation would roll over into the next year adding up to 12 weeks of vacation plus sick time for the coming year it was a big hassle for hr to process the waiver but since i had produced a lot of new business my manager was all too happy to order it done i wasn't upset about working through year end though i flew back and forth to ca for christmas on a 24-hour turnaround I rationalized it, hoping that I'd get paid the first big bonus of my career in a few months. At that time, European firms paid their bonuses in mid-April, while employees of US-based firms got their bonuses by the end of January. If you were planning on switching jobs early in the new year, working at a European firm meant that sometimes you left money on the table, aka golden handcuffs, so the timing of switching firms was important. I continued to work at my frenetic pace through April, taking no vacation as I was bringing in more and more clients and digging myself out of paperwork when I wasn't on the road. In the new year, we had some meetings about scorecards and sales goals, and I led my office in some of the categories and was number one for overall production. Finally, in mid-April, my boss called me in and announced it was time to discuss my bonus and annual review. I eagerly sat down, licking my chops, because I was assuming my bonus would be equal to my base salary at least, if not double. He handed me a piece of paper and it showed a number that was almost 90% less than I was expecting for my bonus. I literally laughed out loud and told him it was a little late for an April Fool's joke, but he wasn't smiling. He proceeded to tell me how proud he was of me But that since I wasn't a director, the bonus that I received was the maximum amount he would give me, as there wasn't any more money in the budget. I sat there in shock for a while, then kept asking the same question in different ways. Basically, why did he screw me on my bonus? It was like talking to a brick wall. Despite pointing to the scorecard that showed me as the best producer in the office, all the while having no junior associates, he wasn't having it. I was crushed, but I then asked him if he was promoting me to director, since I demonstrated that I could produce, hoping that that title would at least be a gateway into the big payday the following year. He shook his head and replied, maybe next year, if you prove that this year wasn't a fluke. It was a gut punch. He also rationalized that while my review was positive, I had some flaws that I needed to work on, mainly that I didn't work very well in a team atmosphere. I reminded him that I was a team of one, so there wasn't anybody on my team to complain about me. A switch finally flipped in my brain as I realized I'd just gotten majorly screwed and there was no change in the outcome. I told him that I was feeling ill and would be taking some sick days, so I got up and left his office. My coworkers said that I looked as white as a ghost as I walked out of his office, so they knew that something was wrong. I forwarded my incoming calls to his extension, 
packed up my important papers in case I decided to never come back, then headed back to my apartment in a complete rage. I called my family and told them that I needed to come home for some much deserved vacation. So, after drinking myself senseless for 48 hours and forwarding all my calls to voicemail, I called into work the following Monday and told my boss that I'd be taking a vacation week. He was pretty angry about the short notice as he'd been dealing with my irate clients contacting him about their problems since I couldn't be reached and he didn't have much of a clue as to how to handle the paperwork necessary to do the work. So other associates were now being called in to help handle my workload. I flew home and made a few calls to people I'd worked with, hoping for some job leads. I managed to grab a lunch with an old associate who'd left the firm and he gave me some ideas and contacts. So I spent the rest of my vacation looking for a new job. I knew the timing sucked. So out of options, I went back to my job the following week. The first day back, I looked at my HR data and realized that I still had 11 weeks of vacation to use that year, plus a few more weeks of sick leave. Around that time, there was a company-wide conference call to celebrate a big company milestone. I think the firm was 125 years old, but I didn't care anymore. To celebrate the big anniversary, we were told we'd be getting an extra week of vacation that year. Meaning, once again, I had three months of vacation in my accounts. As a high performer, I was also selected to spend a few weeks in New York during the summer and fall for some management training. So that meant even more additional time out of the office. The next month was a blur of looking at different vacation options for me to take that year. I'd accrued a lot of hotel and rental car points and frequent flyer miles during the past year of traveling around. So I spent my days in the office doing as little client work as I could get away with while spending the rest of the time on the phone with the frequent flyer hotel points customer service reps trying to squeeze as much vacation out of my miles and points as I could. By the end of May, I submitted my vacation requests, which detailed how I was going to take three months of vacation in the seven remaining months of the year. I submitted the forms to HR, and within a day, my boss called me in to discuss my schedule, as he realized that I was basically gonna be gone for almost two weeks out of every month for the rest of the year. I was wrapping my vacations around federal and bank holidays whenever I could manage it. He told me that he was rejecting my vacation schedule since there wasn't anybody to cover my clients in my absence. I asked him to call in the HR rep into his office to have his stance officially on record. He objected, but I said I wouldn't discuss such matters without an HR rep present. HR was called in and my boss told HR he was rejecting my vacation schedule. But HR responded that I was legally entitled to take those vacation days, so he couldn't reject the request. I also told him that, henceforth, I wouldn't be handling any of my customers from my personal cell phone if I was out of the office. So I'd be forwarding my work phone to his when I was on vacation or doing business development trips. I also told him that I was going to Europe on two different trips and would be unable to be contacted since I didn't have a company-issued cell phone. He was fuming but he knew that unless he promoted me to director and issued me a cell phone, he couldn't do anything about my new stance. After that, I only did business development in areas where I like to travel, and more importantly, vacation. Until that point, I'd always said yes to any meetings in backwater locations if it represented a chance to land a new client. Having learned my lesson the hard way, I didn't want any new clients to begin with, and certainly none living in areas I didn't like to visit trips to florida became common if i was traveling i would typically spend monday to wednesday making very infrequent sales calls most of my schedule was falsified with fake prospects so i could spend afternoons playing golf or hanging out at hotel pools trolling for women my age then i'd take off thursday and friday with vacation and sick days so i could hang out and have fun using hotel points to extend my stays for free since i was still underpaid I ate cheaply and learned to squeeze as much out of my trips for the least amount of money I could manage while still having fun. My boss was now irate with all of the customer calls coming to him, but he refused to hire an assistant for me, so I kept forwarding my line to his when I was out of office. Whenever I was back in the office, which was pretty infrequently at this point, he would routinely lambast me with verbal warnings about poor performance reviews but I'd just shrug my shoulders and tell him that maybe he was right not to promote me to director 
since I was clearly such a disappointment. He was also annoyed because he'd been commended for having such a high producing office the year before, mostly courtesy of my efforts, and now he was getting a lot of heat from New York that his new client numbers were down. Since I had frequent flyer miles and hotel points, but not a lot of money, I backpacked through Europe on two different two-week trips that summer and also took a number of vacations back home, diligently following up on job leads on the West Coast that I'd cultivated whenever I was in the office. By October, I started to firm up some conversations with a prospective employer back in California and I finally received a concrete job offer in mid-November. I waited until December the 15th to inform my boss that I was quitting the firm and told him I'd be using my two remaining weeks of vacation and sick leave so that my resignation was effective immediately. He was surprised that I didn't wait until April to leave, but I laughed, telling him I knew he was going to screw me on my bonus anyway, so the money wasn't worth waiting around for. He then asked me to stay through the end of January in order to give him enough time to hire and train an assistant or a replacement to handle my clients, but I refused noting that Jeremy had quit 20 months before, so we had plenty of time to prepare for this eventuality. As I was packing up my office and informing my co-workers about my departure, I got a knock on my office door from the HR rep as he wanted to conduct an exit interview. He closed the door and I aired out all of my dirty laundry. I told HR the firm had lost me when my boss had screwed me on my bonus, repeating the story that there wasn't any money in the budget. The HR counterpart shook his head and laughed at my boss's stupidity, noting that since Jeremy had been an employee at the beginning of the year I'd arrived, his salary and bonus was actually in the budget for the whole year. As such, my boss could have allocated the amount that he would have paid Jeremy to my bonus, which probably would have kept me reasonably happy. Instead, he decided to screw me over. I moved back to California that week and started the new job the first week of January. Three months into my new job, I got a call from a co-worker at my previous firm. He called to tell me that after I left, HR from the head office in New York came down early in the new year to interview my former co-workers. Apparently, my sudden departure had raised some eyebrows in New York as they viewed me as a rising star and questions were asked as to why I left so abruptly. Apparently, other employees in my office had also gotten screwed in various ways, Lots of client development meal expenses were rejected for being too expensive by the guy who was routinely billing his meals with friends to the firm. So after listening to all the complaints, New York management decided to make a change years before he was due to be rotated back to Europe. Since he was related to a guy on the board, they couldn't fire him. So they reassigned my old boss to some backwater farm town. I couldn't pronounce the town, but I was told it was the kind of place that doesn't provide perks, like allowances for housing, accounts for expensive state restaurants, or a new Mercedes. I started my own company five years back, and it's worked out pretty well. Even though I got screwed 25 years ago, I always think about that experience fondly, as I probably would have worked for a company like that for my entire life had I not been shown how companies and bosses would generally screw you over if given half a chance. It was eye-opening and put me on a path to eventually start my own firm. So for that, I'm forever grateful. I always think about that situation around New Year's to remind myself of how far I've come and for how not to treat my employees. Hopefully, some of you can benefit from my experience without all of the drama that I went through. Happy New Year. So there you go, guys. Uh, I've got to say, OP, you are an absolute legend. The things that you did to absolutely mug off your boss, all completely legally, by the way, all above board, just very sensible things, one after the other, to just completely destroy him, were great. And I loved every single one of them. I guess this just shows a problem with nepotism, right? Because the only reason that this guy has got this job, your boss that is, in the first place, is because, what, his family member's on the board. He clearly doesn't know what he's doing. Uh, the things he's asking of you are silly. And the fact that he hasn't rewarded you for being one of the company's star employees. I mean, the board themselves have said you're a rising star and you get a terrible bonus when you're working so hard, putting in so much effort and then just getting no reward. Doing the job of two people, remember, and getting nothing for it. Yeah, silly. I mean, at the very least, Give him a promotion. That's the least he deserves. But hey, if you're not going to do that and you're going to mess OP around, well, he'll do the same back to you. And look, it's good karma once again. The good thing about this story is, though, that at least the New York office noticed how important you were to the company and there was a big inquest when you left. Look, it would have been better if they'd stopped it before you left and had fired the manager instead, but at least they clocked it. 
right? Because normally, like, you know, they wouldn't really care, would they? It's not really their most important thing that's going on at the moment. I'm sure they've got more important things to deal with, like the company's future than just one employee. But the fact that they noticed how good you were and how badly you've been treated is really important. And it also shows how important you must have been to the company for them to take any notice of you. Yeah, annoying they let it go. But at least you weren't just, you know, chucked out. No one really knew what happened. You were just gone and that was it. At least there was a proper inquest. You got some sort of justice in the end by doing well yourself. And, you know, seeing this guy get sent right back down the company ladder to probably where he belongs. I'm not left-handed. I'm also not allergic to poison ivy. So, I'm one of the few people who aren't allergic to either poison ivy or poison oak. A superpower I once used for evil. Small evil, not the bad kind. When I was in the Boy Scouts, it was still a quasi-paramilitary organization, and we went on a camping trip for a jamboree one summer. I was about 13 or 14 at the time. This particular jamboree had us camping all week long with our local National Guard. They instructed us that week on shooting the M14 and M16, as well as the M2 and M249 machine guns. They also instructed us on pathfinding and had us running a 10-mile course through the Arkansas countryside. I suppose I should mention that I absolutely hated most of the scouts in my troop. Half of them were psychopaths. One of them chopped a kid's finger off after the kid dared him to, and the rest were a bunch of little entitled D-bags, so I really didn't have a single friend in scouts, ever. It's one of the reasons I eventually quit. Towards the end of the jamboree, shortly after I woke up on Saturday morning, our head scouts, an Eagle Scout no less, whacked me in the forehead with the butt end of a knife that he was using to eat peanut butter directly from the jar. Why? I don't know. Just because I was there and he felt like it, I guess? Now, the day before, while we were doing some basic reconnoitering of our course, I happened upon a patch of poison ivy and noted its location on my pathfinding map. After the silverware incident, I honestly hadn't really thought of getting back at him or any other of his psychopathic sycophants who thought me getting thumped in the head was funny. However, when it came time for me to take over on our pathfinding march, we were only a couple of hundred yards from that patch of poison ivy I found the day before. I didn't know if anyone else knew it was there, but I had an opportunity. And if the Boy Scouts taught me anything, it was... Whenever an opportunity presented itself, you be a man and you freaking go for it. Well, alrighty, if you insist. The best part was, because it was July, we were all wearing shorts. I marched us straight through the patch and not one single scout, tenderfoot, life or eagle identified it. They were completely, beautifully oblivious. I had the best night I'd ever had on any camping trip in scouts just a few short hours later as i listened to the cries of every single scout in my troop as they went absolutely mad from the horrible pain and itching that poison ivy causes and the cherry on top not one of us nor any of the other troops nor even the national guard guys had even a single freaking drop of calamine lotion it was the most cathartic revenge i've ever experienced after all of the BS and bullying I'd put up with from those little Lord of the Flies idiots, the sweet sounds of their suffering lulled me gently to sleep that night. We had to break camp immediately the next morning. Ah, oh, dang it. I was just starting to have fun. I don't know what the National Guard guys had planned for that day, but I didn't care. I never wanted to go on that jamboree in the first dang place. I got home early on Sunday, and it was one of the best days ever, as I happily returned to a wonderful shower, a clean bed, and our lovely, lovely air conditioning. Wow, what a great way to start today's episode. The best thing about this revenge, in my opinion, is that there's no way that anyone would ever know, really, that it was your doing, right? How could people know that you knew that you were not allergic to poison ivy or that you took them through that path on purpose? It's just like, it's so innocent. You can always just say, oh, I just didn't realize. What can they say? You can't disprove the fact that you had no idea. It's great revenge that affects so many people that you dislike and there's no way they can pin it on you. It really is brilliant. Gotta say, OP, slightly sadistic, um, when you said the sweet sounds of their suffering lulled me gently to sleep that night Th that's mental but i do kind of rate it just really good revenge excellent stuff now for our next post it's taco tuesday bitch. i'm not using my regular account for this one because there's some mildly incriminating stuff and i don't need to be identified i'm thinking i should make this my dark secrets account because holy heck 
I've got more. I used to enter recipe competitions for fun as a bored housewife. I was good at finding them online. I had a system, knew what the promoters wanted, and I usually won. So some guy starts some kind of health and fitness website and runs a recipe competition to promote it. I do the thing, a Buddha bowl if you're wondering, and as usual, I'm announced the winner. Congrats, OP. You've won $1,000. It's usually not a cash prize, but okay. Awesome. Except this guy never comes good with the money and just ghosts me instead. I decided to send one last message and move on with my life. I can use the recipe and photo again since it was never published. He finally responds and he's hostile. I'm like, sorry, what? And he proceeds to threaten me with his goons. Or like, I know people in Sydney who will F you up. Oh, he thinks I'm in Sydney. And I tell him to just forget it. I already accepted that I'd never see the money. Instead, I start Googling this guy and I come to find that he is a complete idiot. The proper gym bro, tough guy with no social skills. I also discover he's opening a taco era in Sydney. I infiltrated his Facebook friends list with my creeper account. I added a whole bunch of his friends and family first, so I'd show was having friends in common, and then I used my new position to gather intel. I made a Google account with his mother's name and photo, I'm really that creepy, and left reviews saying his tacos tasted like someone farted directly into my mouth. Then I made a glitter bomb, using a greeting card that opens landscape style with like a tissue paper pouch full of glitter glued to the inside and sent it to him at his restaurant. I googled his email address and found his post on Gumtree looking for a chef, LMFAO, so I make a new email address and I'm like, I'm a friend of the most common Facebook friend's last name, family, and they mentioned you're opening a tacoera. I'm moving to Sydney. I was a chef at my uncle's Mexican restaurant. And do you have any jobs available? You do? Oh, how exciting. Will you please give me a chance? Great. I look forward to working for you. Every day, I had a credible excuse not to show and milked that until he was just about done with my rubbish. Then I left a message with an employee. I can't come into work today because our boss, the taco guy, didn't give OP, using my real name then, her prize for the recipe competition he ran on his failed website and then threatened her with violence. And then I waited for him to contact me. He was a little upset and I confessed everything. All the little mind screws, all the petty stuff, cancelled orders, all of it. He told me he'd pay me if I stopped. I declined the offer. I said I'd rather have $1,000 worth of fun at his expense. Maybe next time don't threaten people with goons. I said I might not ever get bored of this. And the last thing I ever said, every time you have a bad day, you're going to wonder if I was somehow involved. Oh, wow. That last line actually probably hits the hardest because he genuinely will think now every time something goes wrong. Was that was that Taco Tuesday involved again? Was OP involved again? Very good stuff. Very deserved, by the way. You can't run a fake competition. Come on. If you run something with a prize and you don't give the winner the prize, that's disgraceful. I'm sorry. Especially when you're directly pushing your brand and you know, you're, you're new out there and you're trying to gain some customers and all that stuff. Very bad form. Deserved. I've got to say, OP has definitely been watching some YouTube videos to come up with this revenge. The glitter bomb for one, that's a classic. You know, using a Google account with his mother's name and photo. That is just, oh, wow, that's a, that's next level. That is a bit creepy, but very good. It's excellent stuff. Great revenge once again. I'm a big fan. Now moving on to our third post. Now this one comes from Petty Revenge, but it's an absolute classic. Spam call me, I'll have fun with you. Like most people, my wife and I get spam callers. Admittedly, we don't often get them, but when we do, we just hang up on them. Until today. My wife starts getting spam calls from the same company, and we know they're spam as they always ask for her using her maiden name, not my surname. So she says, I'll just get her for you, before handing the phone to me and telling me to do my thing. I say, with a very obvious, I'm just messing with you, old woman's voice, Oh, hello. I'm and then wife's first and maiden name the spammer says hello Yes, i'd like to talk to you about life insurance life insurance. Oh, well, you see i'm old I don't have much of a life these days. I'm 93 Well even more reason to get it to protect your family. Well as it happens. I don't have any life at all I died three weeks ago. You you died Three three weeks ago. Yes, I died three weeks ago 
poor old heart just gave out. The funeral's next Tuesday if you want to go at the crematorium on Tarworks Road. Uh, no thank you. Sorry to hear you died and sorry to disturb you. Goodbye. And thankfully, we never heard from them again. If we want life insurance or whatever it is you're selling, we will call you. Now listen, here is a question for you lot. Have you lived if you haven't messed with a cold caller? In my opinion, the answer is no. Uh, not to this extent. This is very good. The fact that he said, oh, I'm sorry to hear that you died. Like keeping up with that, you know, customer service and all that rubbish is just brilliant. Because normally someone would just put the phone down at that point, I think. But hey, I'm sorry to hear that you, the 93-year-old that I'm supposedly speaking to, died three weeks ago. It's very good. I do have to say, though, that cold calling definitely is one of the toughest jobs out there. Imagine the abuse that you get from people. Like, it's just not very nice. I get it. Like, people do it, and it probably works. Otherwise, cold calling just wouldn't exist, right? But it's still tough for these people, like the, the spammer. But hey, look, it's never nice to be, to be spammed with calls like this about things that you just don't like. So you know what? I think this revenge was actually quite justified, and it was very innocent. And very funny. OP, fair play. Oh, by the way, before we end this episode, let me know down below in the comments. Have you ever had the call where they say, you have so many viruses and, you know, software on your computer that's going to kill it. You need to throw your computer in the bin or download this little program. We'll fix it for you. Ever had that one? I remember that one back in the day multiple times. And I just said, you know what? I'm going to throw my computer in the bin. So, you know, the, the more I think about it, the more I have done exactly this. And if you have a story like this one, comment it down below. I want to go and read some of them. I reckon they're very funny. Please let me know. Never anger a rich redneck. This is a story about my grandparents' friend. I was a young teen, but given the outcome, this story has stuck with me. I've sat on this story for a while, but it's so satisfying to see a gaggle of Karens taken down a notch that I figured I'd share. For the sake of this story, we will call my grandparents' friend William. Now, my grandparents knew William from way back. My grandmother knew him from school, and my grandfather met him after marrying my grandmother. Anyways, in the 60s, grandma was a manager at the 7-Eleven. William led a crew that went there every day. It was the only gas station in a 30 minute radius so everyone knew everyone in that sleepy coastal town kind of way now one day william was doing a job down on the waterfront and slipped fell and broke his back while he was healing from the operation and was broke as a joke my grandma would always make sure to send him something to eat that she'd pay for when the crew would come in to grab their usual snacks and gas up knowing William would simply skip the meal to save the money for his own family. My grandpa also took him to several doctor appointments since William couldn't drive for a while and his tiny little wife couldn't wrangle him into a car by herself. William never forgot that. 20 years later, when he sold off his now very successful business and was a millionaire about 20 times over, he promptly told 90% of the world to go to hell, but kept those that had always been there for him close. Meanwhile, he never moved from the house that he'd had since before he was rich. His only concessions to his wealth were trips with his wife to see the world and buying up quite a few acres of the forested land around him. If you weren't his friend, you'd take him for every other blue collar worker in the town. There was absolutely nothing obvious to show that he was worth tens of millions of dollars. After his wife died in the 90s, William decided to take up a new hobby. As he lived outside of the city limits, he set up a sawmill and woodworking shop. He got all the proper permits and everything. The saws were in a big old enclosed building in the middle of all that land. So in all honesty, no harm, no foul, right? Well, wrong. The family that owned the forest behind William's land had just sold it to developers. Thus, the new luxury gated neighborhood, the first in the area, was born. Enter a plethora of Chads and Karens who were mostly from up north and had moved down south to take advantage of the better weather and the nearby beach. It didn't take long before they decided to take offense to his little business venture on the other side of the 10 foot tall wall of their neighborhood because it didn't fit with the image of our community. You know, the community he was decidedly not a part of. So they sued him didn't even try to start a dialogue with him just up and sued him william was livid he was your typical coastal redneck and he'd be danged if those dang yankees told him what to do on his own property that was not within city limits nor located in an hoa william countered with professional noise studies that showed that some of the kids in that neighborhood drove vehicles that made more ambient noise than his little operation but nope 
The people in the neighborhood simply threw more money at the lawyers to continue on with the lawsuits. Essentially, their plan was to bleed him dry. Their lawyers, who were not locals, actually told William's lawyer that he should probably advise his client to close the shop so that he wouldn't end up bankrupt due to the resources being thrown at him from those homeowners. Due to the relatively modest surroundings of his home, the neighbors nor their lawyers had any idea that the man was actually richer than just about all of them put together. All they saw was an older dude who drove a beat up 80s model truck and wore Dickies jeans and work shirts that lived in what appeared to be a relatively modest home, especially compared to their McMansions. When William's lawyer told him about that conversation, William lost his freaking mind. I clearly remember his screeching into my parents' driveway in that old work truck, cutting up a storm and ranting and raving before he even got in the house. He came to our house, why? Because my grandmother, bless her heart, was known as one of the most giving people in the world, unless you annoyed her. If you hurt her or someone she cared for, she became one of the most vindictive buttholes that could be found in that town. I'm not kidding when I say that her ability for revenge served cold was legendary amongst the locals. So, William had come to the house for a dose of her deviousness. Us kids weren't allowed inside during that conversation. But after he left that day, I heard the adults talking about how he proceeded to hire quite a few private investigators to see if there would be any dirt to dig up on the neighbors. That is, the dozens of people in that neighborhood that were a part of that lawsuit. Lo and behold, there was apparently copious amounts of dirt to be had. I still remember him positively crowing about it to my grandparents one fine summer day months later. That 60-something-year-old man was as gleeful as the proverbial kid on Christmas morning. Why? Because after he learned what his little private army dug up, he started making some phone calls to various acquaintances in high places. The ensuing fallouts meant that the lawsuit was dropped. There were quite a list of misdeeds that were discovered, but the ones that I heard talked about by the adults that stick out are there were more than a handful of individuals that owed back child support. William very helpfully had the private investigators provide the mother's updated address and employment information so that they could pursue said child support and garnishments if they wanted to. On top of that, the IRS became very interested in several of those people as well as various other neighbors. And finally, one household ended up in prison because the investigators realized that they were drug dealers. The pictures of the transactions caught by the PIs were helpfully handed over to the sheriff's department. Drugs are bad kids. So then, moral of the story, never anger a rich redneck. Yeah, no doubt in my mind, guys, that these revenge stories where it's seemingly just one person against a whole number of people that think they're just going to absolutely dominate them. But in reality, the opposite happens are my favorites by a mile. I don't know, it's something about the underdog story, right? Everyone in this new neighborhood who's really, you know, wealthy and rich, taking William to be an absolute monk when in reality he's got more money than all of them combined and is clearly a very intelligent person. Uh, yeah, it's just great. Putting them all in the mud, wasting all of their money on their own lawyers and stuff for, for no gain, and then actually just setting the IRS on them and the law as well. I mean, look, they found drug dealers, come on. They're now in prison because they were that annoyed by somebody cutting wood miles away Away from them it really is funny like how that works you would think why would they get involved in that because surely if you're doing something illegal yourself you wouldn't want to accuse someone else of doing something that's not even illegal just annoying it's a bit risky isn't it i guess they just didn't expect it from william sometimes it's the people that you least expect it from that do it the best brilliant now moving on to our next story of nuclear revenge Good luck with the ICE. Now, for those of you that are not American, like me, the ICE stands for the US Immigration and Customs Enforcement. So, this happened about 10 to 15 years ago. It's been a long time. It is the sweetest revenge. My backstory is that I was born in the States, but my family are immigrants. My dad worked his butt off to become a US citizen, working three jobs, riding a bike to work because he couldn't afford a car. He and his dad saved all the money so they could get the rest of the family here. I say this because I understand the struggles immigrants face coming here, starting a new life without any support. I would never do this to someone actually trying to better their life. This POS though, didn't deserve to be here. The story is about my best friend's boyfriend. He lived with her in her family's house renting a room driving her car to work and using her cell phone that her parents paid for. She was 19 at the time and I was about 21. 
I was working at a club with my boyfriend. I worked really late and had two kids. I asked my best friend one day if she could come over and watch them while they slept. Basically, just come and hang out at my place. My eldest son was about six or seven years old, and the little one was less than a year old at the time. My best friend asked if she could have people over so she didn't get bored. I said, sure, I don't mind. I asked that she just not throw any parties. We laughed as she agreed. Everything was fine when we got back. I thanked her and she left. Later that night, I saw a cup with a cigarette butt in it. So I text my friend and asked her if someone had smoked in the house. Now I'm a smoker myself, but because my son is really little and the older one had asthma, I never smoked in the house. I went outside. The reply I received didn't make any sense. It read, what kind is it? I said, I don't know. In my mind, I'm like, well, there were only two other people here. How could you not know if one of them smoked inside? She's not a smoker, so I knew it wasn't her. I started receiving more questions instead of a yes or no answer. The replies also didn't make much sense. They were in broken English with stupid spelling mistakes. By this point, I knew I wasn't talking to her. Instead, it was her boyfriend. Now, my best friend is white and he's Mexican. He was trying to fool me, so I tell him who she was here with. I never liked him not for any specific reason he just rubbed me the wrong way from the beginning they've been dating for about a year or two and by this point i knew he was a pos i really dislike him because of how he treated her he was controlling and abusive and i didn't see her as much anymore because i'd gotten into an argument with him at her house earlier that year we'd all wanted to go out to a friend's place he didn't he said she couldn't go either she wanted to but he said no I told her we were leaving. It was really late, but this butthole made a big deal about it. He decided it was a good idea to wake her dad, so her dad would force her to stay home. Now, this just angered me because he has no respect. He lives in their home, and he can't even let her dad sleep. Besides, she was an adult, not to mention her dad never cared if she was going anywhere with me. Her parents knew if she was with me, she was safe. Anyway, after that minor blow up, I decided not to be around him. I wouldn't be able to hide my contempt of him. This is why she didn't come over to watch my kids with him. Now, I just didn't really understand why she stayed with him, especially after she told me that he forced himself on her. I put up with him for my friend. I knew if I was around, he wouldn't dare to mistreat her in front of me. Back to the text. He's pretending to be her and I tell him I know it's him. He then said he was going to come over and shoot up my house with my kids still inside. I basically laughed at myself. I didn't believe him. I replied with a threat to get him deported. I got in touch with a mutual friend of mine and my best friends. She knew more about him. She told me he actually had a warrant out for his arrest. The cops had gone to pick him up one day, but they didn't find him. The family hid him. He hid next door. My best friend's neighbor was her grandma, so that worked out. I didn't know any of that, and I also didn't even know his full legal name, but she gave me everything I needed. I told her what I was going to do, and I told her not to tell our friend. I called the cops and gave them his location. Everything they needed to know so they wouldn't miss him. They actually picked him up the same night. I then called the ICE. He was put on ICE hold. He couldn't get bailed out of jail now. Once in custody, the only way he was getting out was when he reached Mexico. Now look, I felt bad for my friend and their daughter. I knew she'd probably never see him again, but I believe I did her a favor. I ended up telling her what I did not long after. I didn't want her to find out through someone else and get even more upset with me. It's been so long since then. She never said she was mad about it. I'm sure she was at the beginning, but in the end, I did her a favor. Her life has now completely changed in a good way and her daughter has a better father now. Someone who takes care of both of them. Anyway, that idiot lost everything he owned. He lost his girl, side chick, and was arrested and deported. He also lost any chance of having any real relationship with his daughter. I did hear that he came back, but it took about 10 years. Their daughter was less than a year old then and she's about 13 now. I believe he's met her once since all this happened. He got to see the great life that she has without him in her life. Now, the best part about this revenge story, in my opinion, guys, is how open and honest OP is with all of this. She's not trying to cover it up and, you know, blame it on somebody else or do this all secretly. She's very openly saying to everyone, 
I did this. I got this guy deported. I mean, look, have a look at the comments here. So somebody has quoted part of the post. He was arrested and deported. And I also heard that he came back and then said themselves, aren't you worried that he might know it was you and seek revenge? But OP has replied, lol he knows it was me i didn't hide what i did and i wish he would because i'll just get his butt deported again i've moved and when he came back he was in a different state because he's got no immediate family here i'm not afraid of him he got what he deserved he was a leech he used her phone to cheat on her her car to f around in and lived in her family's house he was a pos and there you go guys like what a badass this woman is what an absolute legend i salute you so good like you've improved two people's lives here that really deserved it and you've ruined this guy's life because he deserved it amazing stuff really impressive like let's be real right this is a lot of work to go through to get somebody deported like this and it's also quite risky really you know, for your own sake it's quite dangerous because if you take away everything that somebody has you know their girlfriend their wife their, their daughter and they've got nothing else to live for then they've got nothing to lose there's no reason as to why this guy might not want to really hurt you i mean look you really hurt him but op doesn't care like how cool is that so brave i love it and you did the right thing obviously i secretly trained my roommates to not respond to his morning alarms i was in college a senior my roommate was a sophomore but it was his first time living in a dorm he'd been a pretty lousy roommate constantly left the room a mess left his stuff on my side of the room and on my bed, stole my alcohol and used my stuff without permission, never cleaned up my dishes after he used them, and a bunch of other stuff. I confronted him about all these issues on several occasions and got the resident advisor involved with the alcohol stealing issue because at the time he was under 21. Things still continued anyways. He asked me once if it was okay if his girl spent the night, which I said no. We were in the middle of a pandemic Plus, that's especially weird if I was there. I also had to wake up every day at 8 for work, which he knew, and he would stay up until 2 a.m. playing video games some nights. Not to mention, he would set like 10 alarms in the morning with a bunch of different alarm tones. I hit a breaking point and decided to do something cruel. Every morning when I woke up, I'd observe his alarm pattern and how he'd respond. He had several alarms that he'd ignore, all with the same sound. He had a couple of half hour alarms that had a unique sound, also ignored, and then the final alarm had its own sound too. All of them were default iPhone sounds. So his brain had been trained to this alarm pattern for a while, I'd assumed. So I started step one of the punishment, set up a sequence of alarms on my phone, identical to his sequence, but an hour early. He responded to my alarms the exact same way he'd respond to his own. I kept this up for a week and his brain was eventually retrained to sleep through double the amount of alarms as before. Then phase two kicked in. Random inconsistencies in my alarm pattern. Some days I'd play all the alarms while other days I'd only play one that his brain was trained to ignore. That way his brain expects to sleep through like 20 alarms and only ever hears 11. He slept through his alarm at least four times in two weeks. Eventually, he finally changed his alarm pattern so he'd only have one alarm and he no longer had the energy to stay up until 2 a.m. Yeah, fair enough, OP. Doesn't sound like the best roommate to live with. I agree with everything you did. I think it was completely justified. And let's be honest, it was pretty freaking clever. I don't think I would have even thought of that idea in the first place, let alone have put it into place like you did. Brilliant stuff. However, one thing I've got to say, um, what's wrong with playing games at 2 a.m.? Not that I'd ever do that, of course, but just wondering, just for like my mate who, who does that, um, you know, what's wrong with it? I'll, I'll let him know. Cheers. Now moving on to our second story of revenge. Now this one is an absolute cracker. Don't want to let me tinker? All right then, let's do business. My grandpa was a successful man and in his mid-60s, he decided he wanted to take a step back. So he started selling off his businesses. He sold his various businesses and spent the next few years traveling. As he approached 70, he got bored in addition to a few new grandchildren, so he needed a bigger house. He sold the home that he'd bought after he got back from Vietnam and bought this massive house on this large piece of land. This property also came with a massive steel barn that looked like this. Now, for those of you listening on podcast platforms, it's pretty much a massive green barn. It looks very impressive, I'll be honest. I want one? 
I mean, yeah, I don't know what I'd do with it, but all right, it looks cool, all right? Let, leave me alone. Anyway, not sure if he'd ever told anyone about his plans, but right after he got the property, he dumped a ton of money into tools and equipment and converted his barn into a mechanic stream. Here are just some things that I remember it having. A professional lift, capable of lifting full-size trucks, those professional oil catches you see at Quick Loops, a dedicated air compressor system that was designed to power all his power tools, a tire machine to mount new tires, so much equipment in general, and his tool corner was a massive corner of this massive barn. His plan? To fix cars, especially for people in need. He lived in a rural community, if you didn't have a car, that was a big problem. So he let everyone know at his local church that he was willing to work on their cars if they provided the parts. He only took a few jobs a week. He was doing this to enjoy himself and help those that needed it. He'd of course change oil, change the transmission fluid and all kinds of various repairs. My grandpa was a talented mechanic. However, he kept the amount of work limited. He was also selective if you were in need he'd want to fix your cars if you had the means to pay he'd decline and ask you to go elsewhere what a selfless man one day the owner of the local car dealership came by and told my grandpa that he needed to stop fixing other people's cars because he wasn't properly licensed didn't have the proper insurance and was hurting his business my grandpa explained that this is just his hobby he only does a few cars a week the owner told him he needs to cut it out or he's going to sue my grandpa out of business. My grandpa said he laughed over this. What business was this guy going to sue him out of? The owner walked out. A little while later, my grandpa got served. He was being sued by the owner of the car dealership. My grandpa thought he'd take a trip down to the dealership and try and reason with the man. He hoped he could come to an understanding. My grandpa spoke to the owner and basically explained... One, he only works on people's cars who are down on their luck. The fact is, the people's cars that he fixes probably couldn't afford to pay a professional dealership to fix their vehicle. Two, he only does a few cars a week. And three, he's not all that interested in getting into a fight over his hobby. But he's not going to back down. Well, they ended up in court. By this point, my grandpa had hired a lawyer who was able to get the city to approve a commercial garage on his property. It helped that he lived on the outskirts of town and had six acres of property. The court told my grandpa his auto repair shop is operating illegally. If my grandpa wants to continue, he's going to need to get a business license, get the proper insurance, and if he does that, he'll be good to go. Now, what do you think a man who has nothing but time and money in this situation is going to do? He's going to get his business license and insurance, of course, which he did, and that surprised no one. But he went further. He got a dedicated phone line, ran into his shop. He hired a full-time mechanic. He put up a professional sign and he set up a little waiting area with a water cooler. What shocked everyone even more was that he ran a local TV ad saying he was a pay what you can mechanic shop, reservations only. And he even put ads in the local paper saying the same thing. Guys, this guy is an absolute legend. Yes, folks, that's right. My grandpa is not only a licensed legal auto repair business, he has a certified mechanic on his payroll and he's running ads. As for his prices, they were quite simple. You either bring the parts yourself and pay the mechanic whatever you wanted. The mechanic got a separate wage from my grandpa. So if you couldn't pay anything, that was fine. Or have my grandpa source the parts. He'd charge you at the parts and you'd pay the mechanic whatever you want. My grandpa started taking jobs. And boy, did that shop get busy. It was impossible to beat grandpa's price because grandpa was essentially paying to fix your car for you. He would spend his days with a mechanic that he'd hired working on cars. He loved it. The owner of the local car dealership was furious and sued my grandpa again. They went to court and the judge basically said that my grandpa owned a license, was insured, had an auto repair business. What he charged his customers for his services is completely up to him, even if that means doing the work for free. About a year or so later, my grandpa gets a call from a lawyer who says he's representing a potential buyer of the local car dealership. However, the buyer wants to speak to my grandpa first. My grandpa agreed. And he sat down with the new potential buyer who expressed his concerns about buying the dealership. 
service is a major profit center for a dealership and he's considering buying the local dealership however he doesn't want to do that if my grandpa is going to keep operating the way he is because obviously it's impossible for a for-profit business to compete against someone selling their services for free my grandpa agrees that there's no way someone looking to make a profitable business could ever compete against him so they came to an agreement the owner buys the dealership and my grandpa would only work on a few cars a week maybe five or six only work on people's cars who are down on their luck and probably too poor to be able to pay a professional dealership to fix their car anyway any parts he needs he will buy from the dealership and any work he declined he'd refer to the dealership the new owner of the dealership agreed to dealership must agree to let my grandpa be and stay out of his way and that the dealership must hire his mechanic they shook hands the local dealership was bought out and for the next nine years my grandpa would fix people's cars who were down on their luck if he had to buy parts he'd buy from the dealership and as for that mechanic my grandpa hired he ended up becoming the service manager and did quite well for himself as for my grandpa when he was 80 he had a heart attack in his shop Luckily, one of his grandkids was there and they got him to the hospital and he made a full recovery. But the doctor told him that his body just couldn't handle working in that garage anymore. He ended up shutting down after that. For the next three years, he looked out his kitchen window, staring at his shop, remembering all the fun he had in his garage. He passed away at 83, surrounded by friends and family. Uh, Yeah, that's probably one of the most beautiful posts that I've read on reddit in a very long time It might actually be the most beautiful ever. That was just lovely Everything about that was great. You know the small man against the big corporate business. Yeah, it's not a big corporate business And you know your grandpa's probably not a small man, but in this situation he was happy He was chilling doing selfless work for no profit in fact losing a lot of money i reckon helping out people in the community this annoying big business comes along threatening him stands up for himself good lad destroying them in the meantime it really is brilliant of course on the whole he's just like a just an incredible man really like giving a mechanic a job buying parts for people and only ever charging them if they can afford it themselves brilliant helping people out in general just for no apparent gain other than him enjoying it what a good lad and i love the fact that he was just like you know what no if we're gonna do this we're gonna do it big i'm running ads for this i'm making a waiting room yeah we're gonna, if we're gonna do this we're gonna do it properly and we're gonna absolutely destroy these mugs because why are they getting involved in the first place no need I don't know why you'd see it as competition really he was only doing a few cars per week you're a proper local dealership you're going to be doing more than a few cars a week i'd hope that's just a little hobby for grandpa but um hey you went to him in the first place and you deserve this unlucky grandpa you're a legend ruined a marriage and my family for revenge i've always been the black sheep of the family cousins grew up to be doctors professors creatives and whatever else Meanwhile, I've managed to just make a humble, stable, passive income through some business decisions. Nothing fancy, but I can afford a one bedroom in New York City and live comfortably with that and a part time job in a cafe. Everyone in the family, including my own parents, judge me harshly for not pushing myself to do what my cousins do, especially my one cousin. We will call him Randy. Think the stereotypical dude bro who got rich thanks to working for his dad. Multiply that by 10 and you got randy anyway he always gave me the most rubbish and eventually i just tuned it out because i get to enjoy my life with my so work part-time and still afford what i want so to cut the bs short randy has a wife and two kids he also had a mistress i found this out because one day when i was walking through the city i saw him walking down the street with a woman who clearly wasn't his wife arms around each other i checked facebook and saw that he had indeed posted about visiting a bagel shop in the city while on a business trip that morning so we head into the city i decided screw it let me see how this plays out i followed them for five hours snapped several photos one of them going into a hotel together i held on to these and waited until christmas that year about six months later I decided to unceremoniously drop printed photos in front of everyone at the table before dinner and made sure to get his wife to see them. Q screaming and fighting, I actually got a black eye out of it. It was Randy's dad who did it though, not him. Q police, a lot of questioning, my SO and I get kicked out. We head back home after talking to the cops one last time. So the aftermath. Besides Randy's wife and another cousin who hates Randy, my family cut me off entirely for several years. Whatever. 
even my parents had always expressed disappointment in me for not applying myself fully so no real loss there randy got divorced he lost full custody of the kids after threatening his ex family occasionally tries to guilt me into apologizing but my response is always some variation of i'm not going to apologize for outing a cheating idiot and then i'm promptly blocked for another few months my so and randy's ex-wife are good friends and the kids call me uncle it's nice having a family who actually loves me unconditionally for once my so and i got married and that's when my family last tried to get into contact with me and were actually nicer ones seeing me moving on i guess eats at them i don't know maybe realizing their punching bag is gone for good and that's it really living my best life now with a good family as opposed to a trash one to me the weirdest part about this story is your family's reaction to what you did i don't really understand it like you're outing a cheater yes your cousin randy is obviously part of the family and it can't be that nice for his parents and your entire family in general to find out that he's cheating but surely you want cheaters to be outed especially when they have a wife and kids who know nothing about it doesn't matter if they're your family or not like it's the right thing to do to be honest i'd even go as far to say that it was extremely brave doing what you did because you probably knew the repercussions and i think it's pretty obvious to say that there would be a big split in your family doing what you did but undoubtedly it was the right thing you can't let that thing just go on think of the kids man think of the wife it's just unfair i tell you what i do absolutely love though like it's just brilliant again imagine the reactions on the faces when they sit down to dinner and see the photos it's like it's so good it is so good. I kind of wish, OP, that you'd filmed it. We had a little video to watch right now of the live reactions. Yeah, it's pretty sad because I can imagine that people were very upset. Uh, I don't want to think about how the wife reacted, but oh, the look on Randy's face when he sat down and saw that picture. Just oh, better than the Mona Lisa, some would argue. Now moving on to our second revenge story. Military revenge story. This was back in 2013 when I was based in Holland. British Marine for context. I'd been married to my wife for a little over 18 months when I deployed to Afghanistan. My wife had a job in the British delegation on base and got to know pretty much every Brit and their husband or wife. One day, we were directly targeted by a vehicle-borne IED. Now, whilst it wasn't uncommon for there to be a threat to coalition forces in general, being directly targeted felt more personal for obvious reasons. That was also the day that I found out an RAF guy back in Holland had tried it on with my wife. I found him on Facebook and, still feeling rather raw about the Terry's trying to blow me up, messaged him words to the effect of, If you go near my missus again, I will put glass in your throat the next time I see you. The next day, one of my bosses, who was also RAF, messaged me on Facebook to say that this guy has been over to his office and basically tattled on me. He gave me a friendly warning, heads up, that this guy could have gone to the MPs and reported me. I've got no idea what would have happened, but I acknowledged the warning and said it won't happen again. My boss had my back and actually told him to wind his neck in. Yeah, oh, sounds like your boss is a pretty good bloke. Fast forward to when I got back from Afghanistan. A few days had passed and I was starting to settle into a normal life again. My wife brought it up. After explaining that she didn't mention it at the time, due to my reaction the first time, that an army sergeant major had tried to message her via Facebook. He told her she was beautiful and wanted her number. She promptly blocked him. I was annoyed to say the least, but I understand why she kept it until I was back on home soil. The next day, I went into our department and spoke to my other boss, an army captain. I told him what happened and he said, leave it with me. He basically had a chat with him and nothing came of it. I felt deflated and even more angry. That was until our senior military officer came into our department. He welcomed me back and asked how my tour was. Still annoyed, I said, it was good, sir. With the exception of Sergeant Major Douchebag trying to get around my wife, he was understandably a little taken aback. About an hour or so later, he emailed me saying that he feels the need to do something official about this. Something I'd forgotten was that the Colonel and Sergeant Major belonged to the same regiment, so having one of his own behave like this had clearly gripped him. I told him the full story and provided screenshots of what Sergeant Major Douchebag had said to my wife. For this to go official, my wife had to provide a statement. Unfortunately, she is very non-confrontational and said she didn't want this to continue. I respected her wishes of not wanting to provide a statement, but I hatched a plan that would be three years in the making. The timing is important. I emailed the colonel and said that my wife has declined. 
However, I felt the need for some formal recognition, so I asked that Sergeant Major Douchebag write a letter of apology, addressed to both my wife and I, which is to be signed and dated. This was granted, and I received said letter two days later. It said, Lance Corporal and Mrs. OP, I am writing this letter to you both to apologize for the torment and anxiety that you both must have felt from the messages that you received from my Facebook accounts. To Mrs. OP, Nobody should ever be in a situation where they worry about going to work because of who may come through the door Especially so when they have the added stress of a partner being operationally deployed at the time The anguish that you must have felt at this time is immeasurable and for this I apologize to lance corporal being operationally deployed is stressful enough without the added stress and worry about family back home Support from home and loved ones is what carries many people through tough times whilst on tour. For any undue angst caused, I apologize. I regret any hurt and anguish caused by this issue and apologize wholeheartedly and unreservedly to you both. Signed, Sergeant Major Douchebag. I now waited. I saw out the rest of my time in Holland, moved back to the UK to my new base and waited some more. Almost three years after I received that apology letter, I looked up Sergeant Major Douchebag's wife on Facebook. I'd known the whole time we were out there that he was married, his wife lived back in the UK, and that he has routinely tried to cheat on her. I sent her the same screenshot which I'd sent to the colonel. I also, before leaving Holland, printed off the emails between the colonel and myself where I requested the apology letter. I blanked out the colonel's details and sent the pictures of that. And then, lastly, I sent a picture of the apology letter, signed and dated by her husband, admitting what he'd done. Once I saw she had read it, I blocked her, blocked Sergeant Major Douchebag, and all his friends who had also been out in Holland at the same time. Why three years, you ask? Well, I remember him saying, before he turned into a douchebag and tried it on with my wife, that he only had three years left to serve. If my timing was correct, he was months away from completing his 22 years and receiving a very nice pension. If his wife decided to go ahead with divorce, she would take half of said pension, which would essentially screw him over for the rest of his life. Wow, that story there is the definition of a slow burner. I did not expect that ending at all. It was all going along pretty nicely and, you know, calmly. And I was thinking to myself, is this revenge really that nuclear or even pro? The end? Yeah, brilliant. Again, like just having that patience and just knowing the more I wait, if I wait to this certain day, this payoff will be unbelievable. Not just for me, but also for the wife. Let's be let's be realistic here. Oh, great. Just the patience to just wait for a little bit of time. Three years, quite a long time, realistically, to get that satisfaction. Brilliant. Well done. You could argue that it's a little bit of an overreaction and... To be honest, yeah, I do think it's a slight overreaction, but still, the fact that the guy is consistently trying to cheat on his wife, much like the first story, it has to be called out. And yeah, we don't know if this guy actually did end up cheating on her, but look, you can cheat on somebody and you can also try and cheat on someone. And to be honest, it's not that different, is it? You, but you, in both ways, you're trying to cheat on the person and you're trying to be unfaithful. Even if you end up doing it or not, it's a thought that counts realistically. Um, Yeah, terrible. But the fact you did it, ah, oh, just when he was about to retire, chill out for the rest of his life calm it all down see how his days no you've ruined them for him insane a homophobe insulted my daughter i may have ended his marriage so my 15 year old daughter has been friends with a girl who lives opposite for years now and in the past there have been sleepovers at both our houses adults always stopped and chatted when we saw each other etc Last year, my daughter came out as a lesbian, and a short while later, we noticed that our friends across the road never seemed to want to chat anymore. Recently, my daughter told me her friend had messaged her to say that she wasn't allowed around our house. Yesterday, I saw them on the road, and I decided I was going to have a friendly chat and see if I could resolve the issue. It didn't stay friendly for long. The idiot dad was acting oddly agitated when I brought it up and ended up saying, I'm not letting your freaking queer daughter try and do stuff to mine. Just because you raised a freak doesn't mean we all have to like it. Now, a little side note for anyone who doesn't know. Although the term queer has been somewhat reclaimed by the LGBTQ plus community in recent years, it has a long history of being used as a homophobic slur. And this idiot dad definitely wasn't using it as an ally. Now, for the next part, it's important to know four things. First off, 
This dad has been working from home since the pandemic started. Second, his wife hasn't and works each day. Third, I've been working from home due to injury for a few weeks now. And fourth, I've seen the woman who visits for a few hours a couple of times a week and I've seen him smack her butt as she leaves. I stay nice and calm. I take a breath and then I press the button. I calmly explain to this idiot dad that just because my daughter is gay doesn't mean that she would be trying to make a move on a friend. After all, I say, men and women can be friends without it being sexual, just like you and the blonde girl who keeps coming round. He got pretty mad and called me some amazing names as his wife stomped back to their house. I'm guessing things got pretty bad as he left the house less than an hour later with a suitcase and a big gym bag and drove off tire screeching. I do feel sorry for the daughter if I'm honest. And if only for her, I did wish afterwards that I'd kept my mouth shut. I'm not sorry for him though. Yeah, it's a very strange mentality for this idiot dad to have. Just because your daughter is friends with a girl who's a lesbian doesn't mean she's going to try and kiss her or anything, you know. It's just weird. I do absolutely love the way that you phrase this OOP. Just so innocent. But he knows exactly what you're getting at. It's brilliant. As does his wife who's right there and just like, oh, can you imagine that reaction? So good. So impactful. Just saying such an innocent line beautiful stuff it really is lovely revenge i've got to say normally we do see nuclear revenge stories that are pretty long you know paragraphs and paragraphs they require a lot of backstory a lot of setup and the revenge itself can sometimes be pretty complicated and intricate but this was just beautifully succinct and short and i loved every second of it because it was just so simple one sentence to ruin a relationship it's brilliant it really is and by the way it's very much deserved do not feel sorry yeah for the daughter sure but not for this man now moving on to our next revenge story keep kicking myself and other students off our remote desktop link for the heck of it enjoy the consequences so this happened last october in 2020 and i feel it's finally safe to share it given the situation at that time going to campus was a no-go so everything was online as such a lot of programs used for coursework which were only on pc needed a remote link for those of us on Macs or other devices. This link connects students to assigned desktops physically on campus through an application like Citrix. It would only allow students onto the desktops when another class was not remotely using that lab at the time and at night when registered classes were done. The on-campus computers would show that their drives were in use, so the students who lived on campus would know that someone was remotely accessing it. Okay, seems pretty logical. I guess just using the campus computers remotely means that no one else can physically use those computers if they're in the lab. Anyway, I was taking a course in remote sensing, which required access to programs such as ArcMap, ArcGIS, R and Erdus. You can look them up. I'm not going to anyway. They were only available on PC. So I, as a MacBook user, needed to use the remote link. The issue started at the start of October when I was working on an assignment in ArcMap. I was really startled when I was suddenly kicked out and then furious because I hadn't had the chance to save my latest inputs. I then went back to the web page, re inputted my student credentials, and logged in to a different desktop. Not two minutes later, I was logged out again. Rightly annoyed, I emailed the professor and TAs about it and moved on to other homework. I figured that it was a bug that would soon be fixed. But no, it continued throughout the entire freaking month. I ended up having to work on my remote labs between 9 p.m. and 2 a.m. as I literally wasn't able to work during the day without being kicked off. It was really annoying, especially since I couldn't even work during my assigned lab time. Other students started reporting this, and we'd get a lot of emails from IT. Updates, patches, and things like that we had to install to try and patch this bug. And nothing worked. It was painful. I decided that enough was enough, and took a train to campus after my online morning classes. If it was going to keep booting me off the remotes, then I'd just go in person. I completed the online health check, got to campus no problem and made my way to the building that housed all the pcs yes we have a building that houses all the pcs for computer classes anyways i went up and towards the lab that my credentials were registered to i'm gonna be honest i wasn't expecting what i saw but i sure was dang fuming through the windows into the lab i saw two guys going from pc to pc logging students off at first i couldn't believe it 
And then I got furious. They were laughing about screwing with hardworking students. I'm going to call them dumb and dumber. That's when I decided to get some payback. I pulled out my phone and placed it beside the window, and it was partially hidden by the trash bin inside the classroom, recording them and what they were doing. They didn't notice me, thank God, and I got onto my laptop, remote linking to my phone. I then got onto the university social media page and started to live stream the video from my phone. I put a title along the lines of, found the bugs kicking students off remote desktop. Video has been deleted and I'll explain soon. It didn't take long for fellow students to take notice of it, and it went viral within 30 minutes. Names were soon put out as Dumb and Dumber were recognized, and there was a lot of hate in the comments. Even campus police replied, asking for the location. Of course, I was all too happy to give it. It was then that I saw on the stream that Dumb pulled out his phone and started freaking out. He'd noticed the stream and that it was live. I quickly rushed to grab my phone and retreat, and that's when Dumber rushed out the door and friggin' tackled me. We started brawling. It was self-defense, as he kept attacking me to grab my phone, and then I saw Dumb going for my laptop, which was hosting the stream, which was still being recorded from my phone. So, I kicked Dumber between the legs while elbowing him in the neck before jumping Dumb. To be honest, I don't really know what happened next, but I do remember campus police having to pull me off Dumb. Apparently, I'd full body tackled him away from my laptop and he punched me in the face. Apparently, I grabbed his carry-on bag, bashed him over the head with it, and accidentally cracked his laptop. Oops. So anyways, the fight was broken up and we were all taken down to the campus police office. To make a very long story short, I got a relative slap on the wrist for my part of it. Had to do some on-campus community service, but my record was kept clean. Thankfully, I was not charged for the fights or the laptop as I was able to prove self-defense and that they hit me first and tried to destroy my property intentionally, which made it a lot worse for them. I was let off on the laptop for a technicality as I was punched in the face and had no idea that he even had a laptop in his carry-on. Phew. As for Dumb and Dumber, I was called in to testify at each of their hearings in December. It turns out, Kicking students off remote links was considered a very grave academic offense as it was intentional tampering with others' work. The video stream I took was a big part of the evidence against them and CCTV proved that they had been doing it for weeks in almost all the computer labs. They'd intentionally messed with over 100 students. Adding to attacking me, I had a nice shiner for a month, and my devices, instead of just running, they got into pretty hot water. Now, the reason that this wasn't discovered sooner was due to the fact that this remote link was new to us and IT was still working through the bugs. I don't know exactly what happened next, as they just needed me to come in, masked, and tell what I did and remembered. However, I did get a notification in my email in March of this year that two students were expelled for intentional tampering of other students' work. Can you guess who? Yep. Dumb and Dumber got the boot for their dumb actions. It gets even better though. Turns out they were here on student visas, which meant that not only were they expelled from the university with a black mark on their records, they were also given the boot from the country and most definitely back to their very disappointed parents. Maybe it's karma, but they got publicly exposed on a live stream for their actions for all the school to see, which was taken down due to it needing to be evidence against them all. But yep, they are expelled twice for their dumb actions and with their names in campus infamy for their stunts. Hope they've learned their lesson. A little addition here from OP. Wanted to add that they were actually put on a cargo flight home as their country wasn't allowing passenger flights during COVID. They had to go because without their visas, they were in the country illegally, which would land them in even deeper hot water. The university actually took mercy on them and paid for the flights, and I agree. They may have acted stupid, but that's no reason to have to deal with border security or whatnot. I only know this because I ran into and was able to talk with one of the campus officers who told me what happened when I went in person for a lab this recent September. 
So yeah, those guys had to take a cargo flight home. I think the uncomfortable experience they would have had was enough of a punishment compared to being in lockup until their country's borders opened or until other arrangements could be made. Wow, what a story. Not only were these two idiots expelled from the university, but they were also exiled on a cargo plane. How embarrassing is that? It's just beautiful. It really is. Just like the first story, excellent stuff. I don't really get the motive behind what they were doing. I don't even think it's that funny. Like, yeah, pranks and stuff are good. I get that. And they can be fun. Even if you're annoying someone. I'm going to hold my hands up and say they can be fun. However, this, like, this is not really that good, is it? Oh, how funny is that? Stopping another student from being able to work. Where's the satisfaction that? I don't get it personally. And I, by the way, I love a joke. I really do. This one I just don't even get. What are you getting from doing this? Surely nothing. Also, adding on to the fact that these guys knew they were on student visas, right? How dumb is that? You know that if you get in massive trouble for doing this, which you obviously would, don't even need to assault people to know that you're going to get in massive trouble for stopping hundreds of students from doing work. There's a very high chance you're going to be sent home. It's so weird, but great revenge. Can you imagine, by the way, the look on this guy's face? Going around, logging students off of these computers, gets a little notification on their phone. Oh, someone's gone live streaming. Let's have a little watch of that. Have a break from logging people off their computers. What's this? It's me. It's the back of my head. Hell hath no fury like me scorned. This story starts 31 years ago, but the revenge part was pure serendipity that began two years ago. I'm going to shorten some, well, most parts, because it is a crazy ride. I learned a frick ton on this journey, and part of the reason for this write-up is to share that with others. The beginning. In 1990, when I was just out of middle school and my sister was still in elementary, my dad met his third wife at the only gas station in our town. They soon moved in together, and my dad abandoned us in our basement apartment to live on a shanty houseboat that didn't run to live with her. He would show up every other week and give me $40 for groceries. Eventually, someone figured out the situation and called my mum. We went to live with her, which was, believe it or not, worse. My dad and his shanty wife got married in 1991. Not long after, she called me and told me my dad's brain tumor had returned. It hadn't, and that he couldn't handle the stress of being around us, that the only people he could bear to be around was her and her son shorty who was my age when i called my dad to ask if this was true he said it wasn't and he just couldn't believe that she would say that to begin with that was one of our last conversations until two years ago the middle there's not much in this part i worked my way through college living in my car from time to time my dad and i were no contact but i heard from my family that he'd bought a house and put his son through some vocational classes. When my grandmother died, Shorty and Shanty wife showed up in a truck and took all the furniture and anything else that wasn't tied down or already gone. Eventually, I went no contact with my dad's entire side of the family. I struggled for years, decades really, but I made it. And I have a great job and a good family now. The best revenge is living well, right? The pre-end warm-up. Two years ago, October 2019, I got a call from my dad's brother, Alan. He told me my dad was in a nursing home in another state. Great. And I needed to go and see him because he needed my help. What the F? Shorty had ghosted him. Insert a lot of laughing right here. The nursing home, coincidentally, was about 20 minutes from my house and I saw an opportunity and I went. The reunion was underwhelming. I didn't want to make amends, but I did want to hear how he wound up dumped and all alone in another state. And it was a really, really good story. Shanty wife got lung cancer and put my dad in a nursing home before she died in 2017. She suffered and I was happy to hear it, but sad it wasn't bum cancer. Wow. Shorty became his power of attorney when she died and had been visiting my dad, living in my dad's house with his two children and taking care of my dad's affairs since his mum died. But now he was MIA and my dad was worried about him. He asked me to drive the hour and a half to his house to check on everything. That's all he wanted. He never even asked me how I'd been. I agreed to go. I think out of morbid curiosity. I'd never even been to my dad's house. I did want to see where he lived with his real family for 30 years. I wanted to see what could have been my life. It was 50 shades of freaking awful. The grass hadn't been cut all summer. 
you couldn't get to the front door for the overgrowth. There were three pickup trucks in the yard. Two were full of trash. Cabs and beds and back seats, just trash. Mail, clothes, paper, shoes, garbage bags. I couldn't understand it. My dad's handicapped modified SUV was on four flats and full of garbage too. I didn't have a key, so I just walked around. From what windows I could look through, the inside was in shambles and hoarded to heck. On the front and carport doors were dozens of notices from the city that they were going to condemn the place. The carport was also hoarded. Boxes and boxes stacked on each other, most rotting from the rain. The yard was full of garbage. Broken Christmas ornaments, more shoes, rusted tools, old toys. There was a letter in the mailbox notifying him that since the house was abandoned, mail would not be delivered anymore. That night, I googled powers of attorney and how to use them. I went back the next day and showed my bedbound dad the pictures on my phone. He vowed to beat Shorty's butt, then asked me to help more. I told him I would, but he'd have to sign power of attorney over to me. All of it. Durable, that means financial, and medical. If he didn't, he could figure this stuff out by himself. He agreed. So I set about finding a lawyer who would drive to another state and do the paperwork in the nursing home. Bless that lawyer for being so good at his job because all I did was tell him what I knew and he put together a beautifully bulletproof POA. It was full of stuff I didn't even know I would need. He also filed the paperwork to revoke Shorty's power of attorney. And now I'm unstoppable. We're from a small rural town and it's the kind of creepy landlocked place that no matter how long you've been gone or how far you've been away, when you go back, you'll see someone you know, even if you don't know you know them. It's like playing seven degrees of everybody all the time. It's suffocating, but it can also be helpful. The beginning of the end. I got to work the next morning. I didn't know how scorched the earth would be when I finished, and I didn't want Shorty or anyone from his prolific inbred family trying to find me, so I made sure nothing I did had my name on it. I opened a Google account for my dad and got a Google number. I opened a PO box for him in his town. I put in a mail forwarding notice. I pulled his credit reports. I took the POA to my dad's small town bank, changed the address on his accounts, and got new account numbers. I requested copies of every transaction back to the day Shanty Wife had died, about 13 months worth. I had to go to the main branch, two hours from my house, the next day to pick the records up. I sat in the lobby all afternoon going through the accounts. I cornered a service rep and got a crash course in his debits and deposits. This is when I figured out the extent of Shorty's staggering stupidity. My dad got about $5,000 a month in disability and social security. Twice a week, Shorty was going into a branch and withdrawing cash, all of the cash, for 13 months. And every time he did it, as the POA, he had to sign a form stating that he was acting on behalf of my dad, and that form was notarized by the bank. I went through every withdrawal and got the bank to confirm that every one of them was made by Shorty. Then I went to the house and called a locksmith. I knew it was bad, but I had no idea what was waiting for me there. He got the first door open and the stench rolled out like a fog bank. We both gagged. Two locks later, I was so embarrassed by what he had to see and smell, I gave him a $60 tip. And with shiny new keys in hand, I called the cops. I told them I was POA for my dad, was checking on his house, and there were three vehicles there that didn't belong to him. He asked me if I knew who they belonged to. I said no, and I wanted them towed. He told me to call a tow company and he would meet them there. They showed up with two wreckers. The tow truck guy got out and asked me for a signature. I only signed my first name. As I was signing, he asked, Do you know Shorty? Running on pure hatred at this point, I surprised myself. Do you? I asked. Now he said he did and that he's a butthole. I responded, "Uh, He might be. Hey, can you do me a favor? If you see him, will you tell him that I am coming for him? His bravado evaporated. He knows a crazy guy when he sees one. They towed the trucks. When everyone was gone, I opened the door in the carport to peek in. The sun was going down and it was dark in the house. I heard something faint, and after some seconds, I realized it was the roaches and the rats doing their roach and rat stuff. I could smell it all in my hair. I sat on the carport steps and watched the sun go down. I was mad. 
just so freaking cosmically livid that 72 hours was all it took to dissolve three decades and here i was stinking and listening to the rats and cleaning everyone else's rubbish up taking time away from my family and for what i had a coming to jesus with myself i could either bow out now or double down and the thing is i'm tenacious to a god dang fault i had to be to survive and this was a bone i couldn't put down the thought of shorty's life being upended his only source of income probably disappearing literally overnight and my dad having to hear secondhand from me that he's broke and alone made me absolutely giddy i desperately wanted them both to lose what they had left so i decided i was going to triple dog down that night I googled restraining orders and it was surprisingly easy to get one I went to the courthouse in my hometown went to the clerk's office and told her I needed a restraining order I filled the form in at a rickety little table while I was there Now I wasn't prepared to see a judge that day, but she took the form and said, okay I'll see if the judge is still here Now that kind of scared me She took me to his chambers and as I was waiting I looked around and saw he had certificates of appreciation hanging up from various veterans groups Then I wiped my palms and thought fish in a freaking barrel He asked about my dad's stint in the marines and about the dod office logo on my sweater I'm a contractor. He read my form and granted the temporary order I would have to go back for the permanent one where shorty would be able to argue against it Then I went home and googled biohazard companies and elder abuse statutes in my states I hired a biohazard company to shovel all the rubbish out of the house for seven thousand dollars Honestly, I would have paid double They found my dad's mummified dog under some pizza boxes in the master bedroom They sent me pictures and salvaged some papers Shorty was served during this time and a hearing was set. I got to work collecting and documenting everything. I made pictures and spreadsheets and timelines with cross-references because screw it, now they had my full attention. The paid versions of Truthfinder and Trello seriously got me through all of this. In my spare time, I went to the nursing home and gave my dad 8x10 copies of the pictures of his dead dog. From every angle before court i went to the police station nearby and told them i wanted to report an elder abuse crime a white collar detective came out and told me it was a domestic matter and that since shorty had been poa everything he'd done was legal and this was the day i got to teach a small town detective about the fiduciary responsibilities of a poa thanks google i handed him a copy of the statute with the applicable sections highlighted Then I handed him a thick folder with bank statements, pictures of the hoarded house and dead dog, a copy of my dad's credit report that showed he was tens and tens of thousands of dollars in debt, and a spreadsheet listing every cash withdrawal with a running total of the stolen amounts. The grand total was just over $130,000 in cash. And that's not including the lost value of the house or the credit cards he opened and used. I told him he could keep that folder since it wasn't the only one I had Then I told him I would wait for a case number and I sat down He came back about 30 minutes later and apologized said I had a case and gave me a case number Then I headed over to the courthouse. This is the end There were other people there and I had to wait my turn And while I was waiting that stupid mother effer schlepped his sloppy butt into the courtroom by himself and obviously, literally, non-metaphorically, dirty. His shoes were untied, and that turned my giggle box over. Then it was our turn, and we stood up. The same judge asked me some questions, asked him some questions, and asked me if I had any proof. I had a very thick folder of it. The judge asked me if I'd gone to the police. Well, yes, sir, I have. Do you have a case number? As a matter of fact, well, the order was granted permanently and for life, but not before the judge halted proceedings and told Shorty he needed a lawyer. Someone told me that the courthouse would have a copy of my dad's DD214 discharge papers. So while I was there, I got a copy of those, because why not? I also used my POA to take Shanti's wife off the deed of the house. That way, if my dad died and it went into probate, Shorty had no immediate claim. 
I also went and got copies of my dad's birth certificate and Shanti wife's death certificate. Technically, stepchildren can't request that info. But the clerk who waited on me recognized my dad's name and told me she lost her virginity to my uncle Alan in the 60s and went to my grandparents' funeral. So I got all the forms I wanted. Wow, unbelievable. Shanti wife left my dad $50,000 in life insurance. About 35,000 of that was left since Shorty was spending my dad's money and not his mum's. So I opened an ally account and transferred every penny over. Then I set up recurring transfers for the monthly deposits. At any given time, there was no more than $100 in his accounts. I also found a house flipper that paid me enough for the house to pay off his mortgage. That's the thing about probates. There's nothing to fight over if there's nothing there. And I made sure there was freaking nothing there. My dad died thinking he still owned a house. Speaking of which, this is about the time I found my dad's life insurance policies. They were up to date and Shanti wife was the beneficiary. My POA didn't allow me to change beneficiaries, but it allowed me to assign them. And since Shanti wife was dead, there was technically no beneficiary. This is where the death certificates came in handy. I assigned my sister and me as beneficiaries. Irrevocable too, which means that the only way to change that is for my dad and me and my sister to agree to it. I kept my dad in the dark about all of this. The only thing he ever really knew about was the restraining order and his dead dog. I found out that he had purchased the gravesite next to Shanti wife and wanted to be buried next to her. That was just never gonna freaking happen. I googled national cemeteries and found out he qualified to be in one since he was a disabled Vietnam era veteran. So I arranged for that instead. Finally, all the cherries on top. My dad died in June this year and I was there. He's buried in a national cemetery far away where no one will ever go and visit him. The only obituary I ran was on the funeral homes website, and that was only for insurance purposes. I wrote it as vaguely as possible. There was no service. His urn is purple, the color he hated most. W wow, I mean, that is petty, but incredible. I got a call in August from the prosecutor's office in my hometown. The lady on the other end is married to my first cousin, because of course she is. That's how it freaking works there. Shorty was arrested just after midnight on July 1st, was still in jail, and had been arraigned on felony elder abuse charges. He's facing 10 years in prison. Now, she told me not to expect the child anytime soon, as it can take up to three years for that to happen. I told her that was awesome, since the uncertainty will hopefully haunt him. And after all of that, he's still got prison to look forward to. He lost his kids. He lost his dad. I'm spending his mum's cancer money. He lost his free house and trucks. He has no credit and will never be able to get any sort of decent job and will, hopefully for a long time, not be able to find a decent place to live. And I sleep like a freaking baby. Guys, where do I even start with that? So, like, what, what a story. That is just so good. So well written, by the way. I've got to say thank you, OP, for writing so beautifully and, and structuring the story so well. The patience you showed over such a long time, three decades, is actually incredible. Like, I don't think I'd have a patience for, for three months, I'll be honest, with something like this. So fair play to you in the first instance. Second of all, the dead mummified dog. That's just cruel. Like, of all things that have happened in this story, that is what stands out to me. Why? Why? Parts of the story were definitely quite petty, I'm not gonna lie. I mean, the purple urn is brilliant. Parts of it definitely fall into r slash pro revenge, but I think given the longevity of what's happened in the story and how dedicated you were to this, just ruining lives in every way you could, this has to be nuclear revenge. It was that epic. Lie about having COVID to take six weeks off while I do your work for free? I'll throw an all office party to announce where you really were. Mid pandemic, my boss disappeared. Just as we were gearing up for our most challenging, time intensive project in the last five years, he dropped off the face of the earth. We kept working for a week or so without him because everything was virtual and the virtual work world was still so new, we didn't really need him. We were delegating tasks ourselves and completing things on our own. We spoke to co-workers maybe twice a week. But some decisions were beyond our discretion, so we couldn't move forward on those aspects of the project until we received a response from him. After about 7 to 10 days of total silence, we called his boss's boss, who informed our team that our boss had COVID, 
so wasn't able to work right now We took that at face value and of course sent him letters of well wishes and didn't bother him with work stuff Or ask why he was able to notify his boss, but not us three weeks go by still not a word We're beginning to discuss amongst ourselves whether or not he's maybe died We're terrified and horrified and so concerned We're contemplating calling his extended family We're sending flowers and care packages to his apartments Meanwhile, the project has descended into chaos because no leader was appointed in our boss's stead So we are forced to navigate several layers of bureaucracy in order to accomplish anything at all Whereas in the past he would have just signed off in real time around week four or five One of our co-workers suggests he doesn't really have covid but is instead using it as an excuse to take time off We all jump all over our co-worker Asking how we could insinuate something like that and lamenting about what a tragedy our boss is probably living through People were chilly to him for days after that week seven We're undertaking a letter writing campaign to upper management demanding an acting boss be appointed while ours is recovering The project is a month behind schedule. We're all working overtime every day Sometimes on weekends without extra compensation Just to keep up with the cluster f of the boss's sudden absence week eight He finally reappears logging into a morning meeting as though nothing happened He looks well rested well fed and he has a tan Not at all like someone who's just come out the other side of a six-week respiratory virus He says something quickly to the effect of yeah, that was brutal glad to be better and glad to be back Let's get to work But he doesn't want to talk about what happened or answer any of our questions like were you in hospital? What was it like? Etc fast forward to about four or five months after this My sister sends me a promo for a fairly new reality show I'd never heard of it, but it's on a major platform and says isn't this guy a friend of yours or something? I swear i've seen him and you together I watched the trailer for the show and lo and behold There's my boss Participating as a contestant on this reality tv show It didn't take long for me to put the pieces together and realize that he took extended leave to go on tv That he knew he wouldn't otherwise get during this massive project and he lied about it under the guise of a vicious disease That nearly all of us had lost a loved one to I sit and steward this information Unsure of how to handle it. I know confronting him won't get me very far, but I can't just do nothing, right? I'm not close enough with any of my colleagues to discuss this with them and trust that they wouldn't run off and send an all-company email about it So I slept on it a few nights and then the opportunity fell right into my lap I got an email from corporate encouraging teams still working remotely to plan virtual social functions To keep a collegial culture going and to stay in touch among the suggestions were game night trivia and watch party Oh My god, this is insane with the premiere of the show only a couple weeks away I got busy telling everyone how i'd been meaning to get into the show and it's so enticing and exciting Basically laying the groundwork to guilt them into coming to an impromptu virtual watch party off hours I offered to get special shirts made up and send them to each person's house Whatever I had to do to get the attention of corporates Finally, I sent an evite to all my boss's bosses and any other members of corporate I could justify inviting without making a total butt of myself Because this is entirely virtual my boss is unable to overhear any of the chatter He doesn't realize i'm hyping up the show and he doesn't realize I planned a watch party for it I wasn't inviting him unless he had the balls to explicitly ask about it I was hoping he wouldn't have heard about it at all not until afterwards That was really the only way this could work the night comes and i'm screen sharing the show to a whopping 64 people a huge chunk of my department Many members of corporate had showed up because I was the only person stupid enough to buy into their virtual social work party scheme So they felt pressure to support it. I was holding my breath hoping this would go my way Bracing myself for some kind of curveball, but there wasn't even that dramatic of a build-up Right at the outset, they introduced the premise, which included the contestants being in a COVID safe bubble in an exotic location And then gave a brief overview of each contestant as my boss was introduced right down to what he did for work I could see people register delight and surprise then go blank just before sliding into confusion and rage 
The chat took a drastic turn from, oh my goodness, and I knew him when, etc., and all sorts of pithy jokes, until a brave member of my team, or perhaps one just pushed a tad too far by all the extra hours he pulled in this douche's absence, sent the message, wait, when was this filmed? My audience dropped from 64 to 58 to mid 30s, and by the time the episode was over, it was just me and the other 15 core members of the team. One asked if I'd already known, but some members of the team are very close to the boss. So all I said was, well, I definitely do now. And we wrapped up the call pretty quickly after that. Perhaps one of the best bonuses is that you could already tell from episode one that the character arc the show assigned to our boss was Bumbling Idiot. He had his true colors on in full display and some production massaging up them to the 11th degree. My boss was, as you can imagine, fired. My good buddy was promoted to his place. I am an office legend now especially since no one is 100% sure whether or not what I did was intentional. And it was all so satisfying that it was almost worth the dozens of hours of uncompensated overtime that led to it. Yep, no, there it is. That is hands down the best revenge story I think I've ever read in the entire history of my channel, which by the way is coming up on three years. That's it right there. How does it get better than that? Honestly, that, that story was incredible. Look, I don't even care that your boss is quite clearly one of the most stupid people to ever walk on this planet. I don't know how he ever thought he was going to get away with that. It's so obvious. You're on TV in front of millions of people. I mean, seriously. Words cannot explain how stupid that is. But to have a watch party, encouraged by a corporate, knowing full well that your boss is going to be on the show you're watching. Oh, it's just, it's just delightful. It's so good. Listen, guys, comment down below. Is that the best revenge story that I've ever read on this channel? If you're a long time subscriber and viewer of me, you'll know that I've read a lot of revenge stories. Listen, is that the best? Comment down below. I think it just might be. And now moving on to our second story of petty revenge. Campus R word dropped ID card. So I maxed out his meal plan and bought people snacks. Then I cut the card in half. When I was an undergrad, a famous American singer's son went to my school. He was awful. He had a reputation for beating people up at parties and brutally aring women on campus. This guy and his brother were both arrested for assault a few years back. Some women came forward to testify against him and his dad said in response, boys will be boys. His son was only suspended for a few months when he should have been expelled and never allowed back on campus. I never had classes with this guy and I didn't know him personally, but I knew what he looked like and I always steer clear. One day I noticed he was walking in front of me and he dropped his student ID card without noticing. Now I'm not sure if all universities are like this, but our IDs also stored our meal plans and you could purchase credit to put on the card to buy snacks at the school bodega. Anyway, I picked up his ID and went straight to the dining hall. I used up his entire meal plan buying food for every student I saw. To be honest, there was only like seven meals left, but still. I used up all the credit he had on his ID card to buy food at the school bodega and gave it to classmates who couldn't afford meal plans. After I finished, I cut his card in half and threw it in the trash. Now, I know that was probably petty as anything, but it kind of felt really good considering all the effed up stuff he did to other people. Now, look, guys, I'm not going to say who this person is, but I fact checked the story and it definitely is legit. All the facts make sense and it all adds up with an article I just read. But yes, it is petty, but completely justified, obviously. Like, let's be realistic. You doing that is not what he deserves. He deserves far, far, far greater punishment than losing a few meals on his meal plan and his student ID being cut up. Yes, it's petty, but it's barely even touching the surface of what should happen to this bloke. And now moving on to our final story, just a little short one to finish. You're ceasing everyone about my supposed cock up. Fine. I'll reply all with my response. We recently launched a project to a select group of beta testers. Late on a Sunday evening, I'm not paid to be on call or work on weekends. I get an email from the boss. CCing everyone involved in the project that the entire site is down. Please can I get it sorted urgently as this makes the company look bad, complete with screenshot of the problem. Now I'm really glad for the screenshots. I didn't even need to open my laptop to see what the problem was. I'm mildly peeved at the tone of the email and I don't think including everyone plus the janitor was really necessary. So I reply all to all, saying that the reason the boss is getting that error is because he has typed the wrong websites into his browser. 
I get a sheepish mail from him the next day saying that no, it was actually one of the beta testers that had sent in the message about the website not working and the screenshots and that he had just forwarded it on to me. And wasn't he glad it wasn't actually a problem? Sure, buddy. Yes, very petty, but I got a kick out of it. To be honest with you, I don't even know if that is that petty. To me, it just seems fair. Like he sent you an email, a personal email, and then decided to at everyone else in the company for no reason. And you just did the same. Karma, right? And ultimately, yeah, it was his mistake. You gotta call him out sometimes. I don't care if he's your boss. Sounds like a Muppet. Call him out when he's being stupid. My cousin stole loads of jewelry. So I stole his inheritance. First of all, a little bit of backstory. 25 years ago, my aunt passed away when I was a baby, leaving my two cousins, who were both in their early 20s, alone to fend for themselves. My grandparents, who were very wealthy, put a clause in their will that their grandkids will receive half of their share of inheritance if a parent passes before the children get to the age of 30, and then the other half when my grandparents eventually pass. Both my cousins, therefore, received a very sizable inheritance coupled with the money they got from selling my aunt's house. The younger of the two paid off her college loans and was able to buy property. She still lives on the same plot of land. However, the older sibling blew all of his money. Straight out of a book of the Bible, within six years, he was back to living in a condo, working as a police officer. Everyone in our small family knew he had a substance issue, so he was barely making ends meet with his officer's salary and buying copious amounts of drugs. The next four years, my cousin went to rehab three times, sponsored by my grandparents. He sobered up after getting his girlfriend, now wife, pregnant. She's an absolutely wretched woman. She saw my grandparents as payday and essentially baby trapped my cousin, thinking it was her ticket. Within seven years, they had three kids, so she is locked in tight. She's a nurse, and with three kids around, they always needed a little boost. Guess who they'd ask? You got it, my grandparents. Now, being the kind spirits they are, they always lended a hand. My father, mother, sister, and I got sick of it very quickly. My grandmother unfortunately passed away when I was 17, leaving my grandpa as the last remaining. I was undoubtedly my grandfather's favorite among the grandkids, which left a real sore spot in the mouth of my cousin and his wife. I had two more years at home before college, so I lived with my grandpa to keep him company and help take care of him. My cousin and his wife hated this, so much so that whenever they came to visit and I wasn't home, they would send their three gremlins into my room to destroy it. My room had double doors, so it couldn't be locked. This was the start. The longer I lived there, the more they would mess with me. My cousin even went as far as to place one of those little mechanical noisemakers in the cabinet in my room. The ones that play sounds at random intervals that make you think you're insane. Thankfully, my German shepherd would always hear it, and after a week or so, she finally found it. They did this to distance me and deter me from taking care of grandpa, so that they could swoop in and be the heroes. This continued until one of the kids found my gun. Now, by this time, I was 18 and in the possession of a firearm. I'm using quotations here because my grandfather does have guns, but he can't aim and shoot them anymore due to arthritis and nerf degeneration. So when I moved in, he placed all the weapons in my hands should the need of self-defense arise. But should he see them out for any reason other than cleaning, there would be hell to raise. Being very well trained with guns and having a sense of pride in defending my home, I took this responsibility very seriously. I always kept a handgun in a locked container in my nightstand with the key on a high shelf out of reach from the gremlins. One fateful day, I am out getting my grandfather food when I come home and my older cousin, his wife, and my grandfather are staring at a gun on the table. It was my gun that I kept in the lockbox. It was loaded and had a bullet chambered. Now, I always keep a magazine in the lockbox, but never loaded into the gun. The lockbox itself was nowhere to be seen. So, my cousin claimed one of the children found the gun and was playing with it. I was 100% certain that he either found the key or broke the lockbox, opened it to get it, load it, as a six-year-old would not be able to reach a key that I could barely grab figure out what it was, load my gun, and chamber it. I tried my best to explain that what my cousin just said was BS and that I never keep my firearms loaded in the house. But my cousin, who of course is a cop, scolded me on gun safety and threatened to have me arrested if I didn't leave and hadn't arrested me yet because 
We're family. I was asked to collect my belongings and go back to my parents. My cousin had won, or so he thought. The next day, I apologized to grandpa and explained to him that there was no way one of the kids could have gotten the key. He agreed with me and he apologized, but he thought it best I move out until things cooled down. But once they do, I'd be welcomed back home. Yes, our relationship was a little fractured due to this information provided by my cousin. A month later, my grandfather died of a heart attack at age 86. I was devastated. I was just beginning to get back into the rhythm with him and rebuilding the trust that was somewhat shattered. To this day, I'm still unsure of what kind of man he saw me as due to my cousin. Immediately, my cousin and his wife began sucking up to my dad. As they'd already sealed payday with grandpa, it was time to move on to the uncle. This persisted for a month or two. I wouldn't stand for it. Then came time for the will. My grandfather's lawyer read out the will to me, my father, mother, and sister in our home. Our two cousins would be briefed individually on their share of the estates, per my grandparents' requests. Then the miracle line in the will comes to fruition. If anyone attempts to claim any part of the estate that is not assigned to them, they forfeit any assets they are supposed to receive, and they will be divided equally among the remaining family members. This was basically their way of saying, if you try to claim more than you're given, you get nothing. My father is supposed to receive every piece of physical property, aside from two or three items he set aside for me, from my grandparents, as he is the only remaining child. So then, moving on to the revenge. I hatched my plan. I called my cousin and told him all of my grandma's jewelry was to be donated to a charity auction. Grandma's collection of gems and metals was extensive to say the least. So a charity event wouldn't care if a few pieces didn't make it, right? It was a law of gargantuan proportions that my greedy cousin could not resist. He bit right on it and headed over to my grandparents' house ASAP, determined to snatch up as much as he could. A handful would send his kids to college. Regardless of what I said, the jury was never going to go to him anyways. So his actions were purely his own, since none of it was destined to be his. Coincidentally, dad was on his way with the lawyer to my grandparents' house to overlook everything. Formality stuff. According to my dad's testimony, my cousin had three shoeboxes worth of grandma and grandpa's jewelry piled on the kitchen counter, ready for loading into his car. My dad and the lawyer stood in the kitchen wondering why it was all there when my cousin walks in from my grandparents' bedroom with a fourth and final shoebox. The jig was up and he put two and two together that I set him up, which was true, but there was no penalty against me for exploiting my cousin's greed, so he would screw himself over. It's worth noting that between the 18 years from my aunt's death and my grandparents' death, their wealth had increased several times over. So my cousin felt cheated and expected to receive just as much as my sister and I, despite receiving half of his already and blowing it. Throughout this whole ordeal, his younger sister, my other cousin, has not had a problem at all and is still weeping over grandpa's death like the rest of us. However, just like that, my cousin lost enough money in the course of 30 minutes that made him contemplate his sanity. Over greed, my cousin's idiot of a wife apparently filed for divorce a few weeks later. We haven't heard from him in nearly six years now as he is all but disgraced. Now you can call this a fairy tale ending and on this particular part of the story, it somewhat is. There was a massive lawsuit by an unknown family member involving the IRS and FBI later on. But honestly, I would rather just have my grandparents. And there we go. That is going to do it for that story. I mean, honestly, what a whirlwind. How greedy of a man do you have to be to do that? Especially after your grandfather's just died. Like, if you're going to steal their jewelry, give it a bit of time at least. What's the rush? Like, at least act if you care. My God, unbelievable. Just imagine, though, like your cousin walking into that kitchen thinking, I've, you know, I've come out of this with so much money. I can send my kids to college, whatever. Spend loads of money on drugs. Whatever you want to spend money on. Four shoeboxes filled with expensive of jewelry and he just sees you there op just sitting there smiling at him and he's like oh my god I- i'm in the mud here I- i'm done brilliant that moment i just wish it was captured on film it's just a shame i just want to see his face i really do i just don't get it right like how can how can a family that's so nice with your lovely grandparents produce someone like this i just don't get it and also his sister seems really nice as well like she wasn't stealing jewelry she actually cared about your granddad and your grandma it's just so weird to me but hey honestly 
FBI, IRS getting involved. Sounds a bit nuts. It's what he deserves, though. Come on, you can't just get away with that sort of stuff. It's frankly disgusting. And you want to know what is actually the saddest part of this whole story? It's not your, your cousin being horrible, because that's just on him, isn't it, really? It's not him taking your grandfather's jewelry, grandmother's jewelry. Yep, that sucks, but you know, those are material things and you can get over that. The worst part, by a mile, is that you're now always going to have that thought in the back of your head. Was my granddad's vision of me tainted by what happened? Like, to be fair, I don't blame you for even thinking that. You know, you were kicked out of his house just because your cousin lied and, and blamed the loaded gun on you. I can't believe he did that. He planted that. That is so, like, conniving and horrible. But yeah, as I say, the material stuff doesn't really matter. You now knowing, though, that your grandfather and yours relationship may have been tainted over something that you didn't even do just because of your horrible cousin that's that's too much how do you even get over that that's is crazy that is unbelievable you steal my identity i steal your cars i just recently found some of the revenge subs around her and spent a chunk of my weekend reading the amazing posts on r slash nuclear revenge last night my husband and i were visiting with our neighbor on our patio and i told them about one of the posts on there our neighbor then shared one of his non-nuclear revenge stories and gave me permission to retell it here now names have been changed in this story to protect the guilty our 40 something neighbor frank smith has a brother three years older named fred with the two similar in looks and build apparently these boys were not obedient children and got into trouble a lot Frank mostly straightened up by the time he reached 21, but Fred kept at it with drinking, drugs, multiple DUIs, etc. While the two were still living at home with their parents in their early 20s, Frank happened to leave his wallet on the kitchen counter one night after coming home from a night out. The next morning, he discovered his ID wasn't in his wallet. Thinking he must have left it at a bar the night before, he tried locating it, but with no luck. Not thinking much about it, he just got a new ID. Fast forward a year or so, and Frank gets a phone call. It's his uncle, whose son works at the county jail. Fred had been arrested, and their cousin happened to see him when he was getting booked, under the name Frank Smith. Turns out, Fred had given the police Frank's name and ID, and was going to jail under Frank's identity. Needless to say, Frank was fuming. He went down to the jail to prove he was Frank and that Fred was a liar. Fred was ultimately sentenced to serve time and stayed put. During the time that Fred was in jail, Frank received a letter in the mail from the state BMV. It said that his two vehicles, an Audi sedan and a VW Bug, were due for e-checks. That's emission checks. Frank was confused though because he only owned a truck. He went to the BMV and discovered that these two vehicles were indeed titled in his name that's when frank realized that his brother who had lost the right to own a vehicle due to excessive duis used his identity to register these cars so the revenge frank asked how much it cost to get duplicates of the titles eight dollars each so he paid 16 bucks and walked away with title documents for the two cars he knew enough of his brother's friends to start calling around in search of the cars lo and behold he located them both at different locations now frank is a knowledgeable mechanic and could start these cars without keys but he knocked on the door of each house where the cars were he explained to each person that he owned the title of the car showing them the documents and gave them the opportunity to remove their belongings from the vehicle before he took it they understood and didn't push back taking their things out of the car and handing him the keys Frank proceeded to sell both cars and pocket around $3,000 for all his troubles. So I guess his brother Fred had maybe bought those cars using Frank's name and then had sold them on? Wow. The good news is that after a stint in jail, Fred got sober and became someone Frank could actually be friends with. Wow, a very interesting short little story there to start off today's episode of Revenge. Pretty crazy that someone's own brother would steal their identity just to buy some cars. I mean, fair play, you gotta do what you gotta do, but my word, that's a little bit tough. I don't really get it to be fair though. Like surely you would just steal the ID of a random stranger rather than your own brother because that's gonna potentially put your brother in a tough spot if he ever finds out that his ID has been stolen by you or, you know, maybe at some point he'll get a bill for, you know, the insurance on his cars or whatever you've been spending money on. Seems weird to go to your brother before a random stranger but hey pretty weird person anyway to be fair though it's pretty clear that he was not in the best place and um the fact that your mates now pretty sick and now moving on to our next post now this one actually comes from r slash nuclear revenge uncle made fun of me for not graduating high school and called my mum a blank so i took away his business marriage kids 
and freedom. So this story happened a few years ago back in 2016 when I was in my senior year of high school. I will start with some info about the victim of this story, or in better terms, the butthole that got what he deserved in the end. My dad has three siblings, all older than him and all equally trashy human beings. They bullied my dad for years and made his childhood hell after their parents' divorce due to him being slightly darker in skin tone than them. Grandma is white, grandpa is brown skinned, same. They were abusive, racist Fs, and the worst of them was my older uncle, who became a big bully and a snob that saw himself as better than anyone else. All the bullying and the bad treatment screwed up my dad mentally, so much that he became a raging alcoholic, which made my life a living hell as a result until I moved out two years ago causing me many traumas that I'm still dealing with till this day. In my country, the most important year in your school life is your last high school year. It ends with a nationwide exam that determines if you can even go to university or not, and the success rate in this exam is fairly low. Basically, if you fail, it's either you drop out and move to low-paying jobs that will never amount to anything due to our country's bad and declining economic state, or you just keep repeating till you get your degree and go to a university that you don't even want to be in, but at least it's a safety net that can get you out of the country hopefully one day. I really want to know what country that is. That is very interesting. Things did not go well for me due to family issues and me having undiagnosed ADHD at the time that was causing me a lot of academic problems without me knowing the cause, which in turn gave me some sort of depression. It goes without saying that that year ended up in me failing, and due to the importance of that exam, people saw it as a shame and kind of a big letdown. Needless to say, due to the long introduction, my family never had a relationship with my uncles, especially that they looked down on us due to my father being an alcoholic and us being dirt poor, which made them think less of us. Bear in mind, they stole all of what my dad inherited from his father, including a house and a piece of land that could have lifted us to at least a mid-class level. Lo and behold, my oldest uncle, who I last saw when I was seven, came to visit us three days after I failed my diploma. Now, I already didn't like the guy after all the stories that I heard about him, and his visit felt weird, like he had no business being around us at all, and somehow he came uninvited. My mum sat him down and started making the usual small talk, and then she called me, saying that he wanted to say hi. I went and the conversation went as follows. Oh, look how much you've grown up. It's been a while since I've seen you. You look just like your dad. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree after all. Even in terms of being a successful person, you're following in his footsteps. Then he let out after that the most loud and sarcastic evil laugh ever. Wait, what do you mean by this? I asked him. Well, I heard you failed your high school guess this branch of the family is bound to be the loser side. I guess you better shut your mouth and F off. No one wants you here anyways. <laughs> I guess your blank of a mother didn't raise you well. What did I expect from hood rats like you? And after that, things devolved into a shouting match and he left. After what happened, I was mad for a while and I couldn't forget the humiliation and I decided that one day I will exact some revenge. So I started plotting. I did some digging till I discovered that all his business and assets are in his wife's name and he basically owns nothing due to him committing tax fraud and ripping off his former business associates out of a lot of money before then declaring bankruptcy, transferring the money and everything he owns to his wife to evade taxes. I came into contact with a former employee of his that agreed to testify if this stuff ever came to court due to him being a trashy human being overall and treated them like absolute trash while they worked for him. Move forward a few months, and trust me, Reddit, I made this account just to tell this story, because what happened later was basically a gift from the gods that helped this story go from pro-revenge to nuclear real quick. I couldn't even hope for a better outcome than this. He came to our house again to speak to my dad, because he wanted to make a golden custom ring for his daughter's 10th birthday. My dad's a jeweler. So while he's in our house, he called out for me, asking for a phone charger, because his phone is dying. And at that moment, I almost jumped from glee. It's my chance to get his phone, dig around, maybe I can find any documents or emails that can be used later in the police case that I was assembling against him. I told him I don't have a brick, but I can charge his phone with a cable from my laptop. And him not knowing any better, like the boomer he is, gave me his phone without batting an eyelid. Now his phone had a passcode, and obviously asking for it was way too suspicious. So my plan to check his email went down the drain. But still, 
I removed his SD card, put it into my laptop, and copied all his files. I then of course charged his phone and gave it back. He eventually left, and then boom. I locked my room and started to check all the files. Now, I found nothing at all for a while, but as soon as I was about to give up, I found a well-hidden file with a few videos on it. And then, I struck gold. A full-blown sex tape of him with another woman, with his face fully available, clear as daylight, And I was literally singing to myself from excitement. So then, moving on to the revenge. A few weeks later, I made a Facebook account and made it look like his mistress's account. I then made a bunch of other accounts that looked like friends and family, commenting and interacting with her. After that, I added his wife and texted her saying that I am her husband's mistress. Now, she did not believe me at first until I gave her way too much personal info that I knew about him for her to keep not believing me. I told her that he'd lied and said they were divorced and promised me marriage. Then she requested to talk to me on the phone. I got a female friend to help me out by lending me her voice and she was destroyed and I sent her the sex tape as proof. After that, she filed for divorce immediately and sued him for infidelity, which lost him custody and visitation rights for his girls. She took everything from him, even the house, and all his money and assets that were of course still in her name so overnight he became homeless with zero pennies to his name but that wasn't enough for me i met up with his former business partner through that former employee who especially hated my uncle's guts and i told him everything and that the employees are willing to testify against him in court he agreed to file a lawsuit the cherry on top came when his ex-wife testified that he threatened her safety and her kids safety if she didn't let him put the assets on her name by force and she literally pulled out phone recordings that she had of him being abusive saying that he will kill them all if she didn't let him basically use her as a tax evasion tool and that she was so scared to use these due to her fear for her children's safety due to their previous divorce case the judge needed to hear no more That man got hit by 15 years in jail so fast that he couldn't even comprehend what happened before he was on his way to the slammer. He'll never see his family again and he'll never have his fortune back. Just to rub some more insult into the injury, I visited him a year ago and I just said one sentence. This would never have happened if you didn't call me a loser and I left. The look on his face while he pieced everything together almost cured my depression. I never told another soul about my involvement in this story, except my little sister, my female friend that helped me out, and now you read it. But I had to make him know just to be able to finally sleep at night. I mean, seriously, that's an absolutely filthy story right there. That revenge is not just disgustingly dirty, it's it's emphatic, life-changing, life-ruining. I love every part of it. See you later, brother. I mean, genuinely, like, what what has OP not done there? Like, degree or not, bro, you're going places. That like, how you uh uh so good absolutely decimated him and everything he stands for absolutely love it like genuinely bordering on psychotic the amount that you've ruined his life i love it clearly to be fair like he's massively affected yours and you've, you've talked a lot about you know being depressed as a result of him and you know even as a result of his bullying of your father yeah it's obviously caused you a lot of hardship in your life so look i completely get it sometimes when people have bad childhoods and they fall out and, and you know have terrible people in their lives it can just be their one life mission to ruin their lives and you know Fair play. It worked out. Hugh Glass, whose comrades abandoned him after he got mauled by a bear. Now, if you've seen Leonardo DiCaprio's performance in The Revenant, then you already know the incredible story of Hugh Glass, who survived in the wilderness after his mangled body was abandoned by his comrades. Before he was left for dead, Hugh Glass was already a repeat survivor of unfortunate circumstances. After he was captured by pirates and served under their chief for two years, he managed to escape to the shores of Texas. He was captured again by the Pawnee tribe, with whom he lived for several years and later married a Pawnee woman. In 1822, he joined a ragtag group of 100 men hired to deal in fur trading with local Native American tribes. Known as Ashley's Hundred, named so for their commander, General William Henry Ashley, the men trekked up the Missouri River and later toward the west for trading. After the group arrived at Fort Kiowa in South Dakota, the men split up with Glass's group, heading westward toward the Yellowstone River. There, he encountered a giant grizzly bear with her two cubs. The bear charged before he could react and mauled his arms and chest within seconds. Somehow, Glass managed to kill the bear, but he was left in terrible shape. 
Nobody in his party expected him to survive his gnarly wounds. Yet, they strapped him to a makeshift gurney and hauled him back to camp. But it didn't take long for the men to realize that Hugh Glass had become a burden to their safety. They were approaching Arakara Indian Territory, a group of Native Americans hostile to American fur traders, and they needed to get out of there quickly. A man named Fitzgerald and another young boy were tasked to remain with Glass until he died and bury the body so that the natives wouldn't get it. Fearing for their own lives, Fitzgerald and the boy decided to leave Glass's beat up body. They took all his equipment with them, leaving only a bearskin hide to cover his soon to be dead corpse. When Glass regained consciousness, he discovered festering wounds all over his body, a broken leg, and his ribs were thrashed so severely that his bones were exposed. He made out his whereabouts about 200 miles from Fort Kiowa, where the men were stationed. It seemed an impossible feat to get back on his own in his condition, but Glass persevered. He set his broken leg and wrapped himself tight in the bear hide and began making his way back to camp, driven by his need for revenge against Fitzgerald, who had left him to die. He sustained himself on forage berries, roots, and insects, and occasionally helped himself to buffalo carcasses that had been ravaged by wolves. After a while, he gained enough strength to walk instead of crawl. He encountered the friendly Lakota tribe and bargained his way onto their skin boats, which he rowed down the river for six weeks. When he arrived at Fort Atkinson, where the Ashley party had moved, he re-enlisted and later landed in the same port where his old frenemy, Fitzgerald, was stationed in Nebraska. According to eyewitness accounts of their reunion, Hugh Glass had stopped himself from killing Fitzgerald out of fear he'd be punished for killing another soldier. So instead, Glass gave Fitzgerald a promise. If the man ever left the army, Glass would kill him. Suffice to say, Fitzgerald served for as long as he could. Now, those of you that have seen The Revenant know this story, of course, but it might have been nice to hear a little bit more background. I just love that this man now can never leave the army or he knows that he's going to be tracked down and killed. That's just brilliant. Like, imagine that at the back of your head. You're like, I can never leave. I I'm done. I I'm literally done. There's actually something so like nice about that. Just Elon getting the revenge and the fear that Fitzgerald is going to have because yeah, look, you could attack him right now and try and kill him and maybe you would. Who knows? But also, how about you just wait like 50 years and in the back of his mind, he's always going to know he's in massive danger as soon as he leaves the army. The fear that would cause for that length of time, mental. Now moving on to our second real story of revenge. Diana, the vigilante femicide bus driver hunter. In recent years, there has been a growing pandemic of femicide in Mexico. That is the abduction and killing of women. It's estimated that six women are murdered every day in the country. And most alarmingly, news reports revealed many of these crimes were aided by local officials and transit officers, including city bus drivers, who sometimes doubled as drug dealers. The worsening conditions have spurred a grassroots movement of women rights activists who are bringing wider attention to this horrific trend. But rampant corruption in law enforcement has often forced women to take matters into their own hands. One of these female vigilantes is a woman named Diana. Nicknamed the bus driver hunter, Diana was a disguised vigilante who worked to avenge the more than 800 girls and women allegedly killed or abducted by Theodad Juarez bus drivers. After murdering two bus drivers suspected of being accomplices in these crimes against women, Diana sent out this letter to local news outlets explaining her actions. You think that because we are women, we are weak. And that may be true, but only up to a point. Because even though we have nobody to defend us and we have to work long hours until late into the night to earn a living for our families, we can no longer be silent in the face of these acts that enrage us. We were victims of sexual violence from bus drivers working the Maquilla night shifts here in Juarez. And although a lot of people know about the things we've suffered, nobody defends us, nor does anything to protect us. That's why I am an instrument that will take revenge for many women. For we are seen as weak, but in reality, we are not. We are brave. And if we don't get respect, we will earn that respect with our own hands. We, the women of Juarez, are strong. Reporter Yuri Herrera, who covered Diana's story on This American Life, spoke with female public transit users in Ciudad Juarez, where the homicide rate is double that of the entire country, about the armed vigilante. One young mother remarked candidly, 
how great that someone's doing what many of us should have done. Another woman commented on her bravery, saying, I'm not sure what she did is justified, but you've got to admit that the woman has guts. The public's response to the vigilante fighting for women's safety clearly stems from the public's hopelessness in the face of the growing murders. First, the police denied the problem. Then they played it down. And finally, they blamed the victim's lifestyle and their families, explained Oscar Mayneth, a criminologist who's worked on numerous femicide cases in Mexico. Possibly wearing a bright blonde wig, Diana's MO has been a quick bullet or two to the back of the head from a revolver. It's unclear how many times she's acted, but her extreme actions have definitely had the intended effect on conspiratorial men looking to hurt more women. We're terrified, said one bus driver, complaining of constant headaches due to the strain of looking over his shoulder for fear of Diana's reprisal. We're frightened of our own shadow. So far, Diana remains at large. And while her revenge against the men who continue to harm and kill Mexican women has not stopped the rising toll of victims, it has provided women some form of comfort that someone is looking out for them. Perhaps they will realize that it's not so easy to abuse women now, one female passenger said with a smile. Wow, okay, so it seems like this story is still going on. I wonder if Diana's ever gonna get caught. That is a, an event that I would love to keep up with. Is she doing a good thing? That's the question. Because look, as that bus driver said, He's always looking over his shoulder now. Innocent bus drivers in the past may well have been killed. Is it worth a few innocent people dying to save the lives of many? I'd say yes, but hey, it's up to you. What do you reckon? Comment down below. And now for our third incredible true story of revenge. The Jewish vigilantes of Nakam, who tried to poison 6 million Germans. It's no surprise that Nazis have been the target of many true revenge stories. After the end of the Second World War, a man named Abba Kovna started a group of Jewish vigilantes under the name Nakam. Their mission, kill as many Germans as possible. Kovna believed in an Old Testament style of justice. Since the Nazis had wiped out 6 million Jews in the Holocaust, the lives of 6 million Germans should also be taken as fair reparations. An eye for an eye, as it were. Abba Kovna quickly recruited his fellow Jewish men to form the Nakam militia, a name likely drawn from the Hebrew word Nokmim, which translates to Avengers. Heaven forbid if after the war, we had just gone back to the routine without thinking about paying those idiots back, said Nakam member Yehuda Maimon of the group's objective. It would have been awful not to respond to those animals. The group hatched a plan simply known as Plan A, which involved poisoning the water supply of five German cities. The targeted sites were Nuremberg, Weimar, Hamburg, Frankfurt and Munich, each one heavily tied to the recently destroyed Nazi regime. In their revenge plan, Nakam's 50 or so members infiltrated the water departments in each city, disguised as engineers and workers to study the water systems. The next part was to travel to Palestine and obtain moral permission and poison for the mass murder from one of Kovner's friends, Kaim Weizmann, the future president of Israel, who also happened to be a chemist. The story goes that Weizmann was on board with the Nakam's smaller revenge plan to poison Nazi prisoners, but he had no idea that they were targeting the water supply of millions of Germans. When the true nature of Plan A was revealed, Jewish leaders in Palestine contacted the British to stop Kovner during his travel back to Europe. Having some misgivings himself about Plan A and sensing his imminent arrest, Kovner sent a letter instructing the Nakam to carry out Plan B instead and had the poison he carried with him dumped overboard just before British authorities moved to seize him as he reached Europe. The new target was Stalag 13, an allied prisoner of war camp in Nuremberg. There, the Nakam Avengers intended to kill 12,000 former SS officers being held prisoner. Under the leadership of Joseph Harmatz, on April the 13th, 1946, the group spread a mixture of glue and arsenic into 3,000 loaves of bread meant for the Nazi prisoners. By the end of the day, more than 2,000 were hospitalized. Although the revenge plan was carried out successfully, reports following the mass hospitalization at the prisoner's camp stated no deaths from the poisoning episode. Whether intentional or not, it's possible the Nakams had spread the poison too thin thus reducing its potency. Ultimately, neither Kovner nor any other Nakam member was charged with any crimes in connection with these plots. German prosecutors investigated the matter 
decades later, but they didn't file charges due to the extraordinary circumstances of the case. You know what? Obviously, I might be wrong here, and there's no way of me ever knowing this, but I do kind of get the feeling that these guys who so badly wanted revenge, in reality, when it came to it, probably started to second guess themselves. It kind of does seem as if they knew what they were doing, maybe spreading the poison too thinly, or, you know, going back on plan A, for example. I don't know. It's an interesting one, though, isn't it? Like, I get the whole eye for an eye argument, but look, six million people died. Do you really want to kill six more million innocent people? Come on. Not really. It doesn't make much sense, does it? And I think these guys ultimately knew that. Now, moving on to story number four. The savage killing of a serial R-word, Aku Yadav, by a mob of women that he awed. Again, guys, I can't say that word, but you can probably infer what it is. Look on the screen if you want any sort of indication. For many years, Aku Yadav was seemingly untouchable, even though he was a notorious criminal. He was known to have awed more than 200 women from the Kasturban Nagar slum of New Delhi, preying mostly upon members of the untouchable caste, the lowest members of India's social hierarchy who received little to no help from authorities. Yadav also routinely bribed corrupt officials so they would drop his cases and had a gaggle of henchmen that worked at his behest. Despite countless women coming forward with allegations against him, Yadav always managed to remain free to R whomever he wanted. In fact, whenever a victim reported him to the police, the authorities would alert Yadav, who would then visit the woman and threaten to throw acid on them or R them again. He'd R so many women in the neighborhood that many believed that an R victim lives in every other house in the slum. How is this guy able to get away with this? This is crazy. But the women's revenge would come sooner than they expected, starting with the actions of Usha Narayani, a victim who'd repeatedly been harassed by Yadav. With help from her brother-in-law, Narayani reported Yadav to the deputy commissioner, who promised that police would arrest the serial R-word. The residents of the slum seemed in little mood to wait, though. That night, Yadav's house was knocked down by angry neighbors and local residents, and perhaps fearing for his life for the first time, Yadav surrendered to the police. The next day in court, Narayani and many other local women, most of them victims or friends and family of Yadav's victims, heard that Yadav was likely to escape punishment yet again. Together though, they swarmed the courthouse, armed with vegetable knives, stones, and whatever else that was at hand. As he walked past the angry women in court, Aku Yadav taunted one of them, calling her a prostitute and threatening to R her again. And the policeman who was escorting him laughed. The arrogance of Yadav and the open neglect of the police who were supposed to protect the woman caused the woman to simply snap and an altercation quickly broke out. We can't both live on this earth together. It's you or me, the woman cried as she began beating Yadav with her sandal. The other woman quickly converged on Yadav as well. The mob was so violent and overwhelming that the police guards quickly fled the courtroom, leading Yadav to the armed mob. The attack lasted for more than 10 minutes and left Yadav's body completely dead and butchered on the courtroom floor with 70 stab wounds and his penis cut off. It was not calculated, Narayani later spoke of the incident. It was not a case that we all sat down and calmly planned what would happen. It was an emotional outburst. The woman decided that, if necessary, they go to prison, but that this man would never come back and terrorize them. Indeed, when police tried to arrest five of the women for Yadav's death, all the women in the village protested, and soon every one of them had taken responsibility for the murder. Narayani and several other women were arrested and tried, but were eventually released due to lack of evidence. The death of Aku Yadav at the hands of the women he tortured was a wake-up call to the police about rampant sexual violence against Indian women and remains one of the most satisfying stories of revenge out there. And there we go, saving the most serious case of revenge, if you want to call it that, till last. That is why you always have to stick around to the end of my revenge videos, because normally, I'll be honest, we have the most tame stuff at the beginning, and then it gets worse and worse and more dark as the video goes on, as this one was. I mean, wow, what a, what a story once again. To be fair, all four of these stories were actually insane. But that one, crazy. I just can't get my head around the fact that everyone knew what he was doing and nobody stopped him. Like not even the police, nobody stopped, no one cared enough. Just letting this guy go around doing what he wanted, just ruining lives, so many lives. And then there being no repercussions for it. 
Oh, I don't think I'll ever get my head around that. That is unbelievable. I mean, you did the right. I don't even care about him. Like, you just did the right thing. Ultimately, if he's not going to be put in prison, then yeah, kill him. I don't care. Get rid of him. Anyway, guys, that is going to do it for this one. Really hope you have enjoyed a selection of some of the best Reddit revenge stories from the past 12 months or so. I mean, a couple of absolute classics in there. Just like that last one. If you did enjoy it and you want to see some more right away, check out the links on screen and in the description. And I'll see you guys all tomorrow for a brand new Reddit episode.